I'd like to call to order the uh, monthly meeting of the Frankfurt Plant Board on Tuesday, May 16th, 2023 at 5 o'clock p.m. in the community room. Uh, Madam Secretary, call the roll. Member DeLong? Present. Member Keybrand? Here. Member Mason? Here. Member Snyder? Here. Member Dutton Mitchell? Here. We have a quorum to do business. First item is consider approval of the minutes for the April 18th, 2023 board meeting. You have those in your packet. Uh, does anybody have any changes or corrections? If not, do we have a motion to adopt? We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Minutes adopted. Next item is consider approval of the minutes for the April 28th, 2023 special board meeting. Again, you have those in front of you. Does anybody have any changes or corrections? Move they adopt. Move we adopt the minutes for the April 20th meeting. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Do we all those in favor say aye? Aye. aye. Those opposed? Minutes adopted. Item number two, <clears throat> accept financials. And Mr. Dinn, you've given us a, a gift tonight too. Absolutely. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. In, in addition, uh, before we get into the, the April financials. Uh, Are there extra copies for families and friends? Or? If they want them. <laughs> yeah, they, they pay for it. They can have them. Yeah. <laughs> we have uh, two different two things. First, as uh, before you tonight, we presented the first draft of the uh, fiscal year 24 budget for your review. Uh, that we have about two weeks before we meet on May 31st to go over that. Um, we have also the supplemental budget narrative that we put together every year is in process and will be delivered to you in time for some fabulous weekend reading. So we'll have that to you uh, by the end of the week. Um, audit update for this year, uh, the board has retained um, Blue and Company and they will be here the first two weeks of June to do preliminary work. And then after we close the year, they'll get into all that um, around uh, August of this year. So I just want to give you an update there. Um, in your financial, in your uh, board packet tonight, we have financials um, through 10 months of this fiscal year through April of 23. I'm just going to hit real quick on some highlights because we'll get into it pretty thick here on the 31st. Um, not a whole lot of change month to month between March and April as far as the balance sheet or our statement of net position. Uh, the main thing I'd like to move over to is page 24 of your board packet, which is looking at the statement of revenues, expenses, and change per net position. Um, I just want to go through the, the current uh, kind of financial performance where we are through 10 months. Uh, you can see, looking at the third column, this is our year-to-date actual on uh, line 20. You can see total revenue just below $87 million. Um, we have had an increase in electric and water usage this year, which has led to an increase in revenue, which is is good with all the capital projects we have going on and also with the trend we see in operating expenses. Um, so we're a little better than expected on budget uh, and also above prior year. But when you look at our operating expenses, line 50, add that to the general, general and administrative expenses on uh, line 275. If you look year over year, we're above, up 8.5% uh, uh, year over year in expenses, which is and we did expect this with uh, inflation has been uh, an issue that we're dealing with as long as and everybody else. So revenue up about two and a half percent with expenses up eight and a half. You can see there's a that's not a good a good financial math problem for you. So um, does put strain on the company overall. But you can see on line 340, our net contribution um, is in line uh, is, is actually above our budget. But it is uh, significantly below last year, um, year over year. So we'll get into more of where we are today and how that looks for us setting up for 24. Um, but I'd be glad to go into any questions you may have about April or the budget or audit or any of those. Does anybody have any questions to David at this point? Or, and just, you know, like we've talked before, um, we've got the meeting on May uh, 31st. <clears throat> and if you have any questions, issues you want to bring up, you know, feel free to contact David. Uh, Gary, between now and then, let them know if they need to research, get information for you, get any questions answered. So when we get there that day, we're ready to go, and mm -hmm. so they have time to check in things and, and get you information if we need to. So and it's one o'clock, right? One o'clock. That should be a great day. We'll go do this, and we'll probably have two public hearings. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if we don't have any questions, do we have a motion to accept the financials? So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a motion and second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Financials are accepted. Thanks, David. Thank you. Uh, information, public comment. Uh, first one is uh, JC here. Scott's <clears throat> 
<laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Staff is pleased to announce that FPB safety record for the 2022 has been achieved honorable mention by the American Public Power Association and our Group E. I want to take a second to highlight Scott and our electric division and all the departments that support our electric division, such as our sports services, IT, finance, HR, NOC, and many more. This award considers the hours worked and the number of injuries over the calendar year. It also considers the utility safety college. It's only through the dedication of our employees that an achievement like this is possible. I think Scott's going to make a few remarks about his department, but it's a big thank you to our employees uh, for their dedication. Thank you, sir. All I'm going to say is kind of reiterate what um, JC just said. You know, if, if this is all from the employees, this has nothing to do with uh, management or anybody like that. It's, it involves a lot of the different people in the company as well. It's just not electric department. Like you said, there's multiple facets that help associate with the electric department. So it's a, it's a team effort, and that's what FPB is about. When I think, you know, commend you all because one, the most important thing is the safety of the employees. And then on top of that, it saves us on medical costs, the insurance premiums. So, I mean, it's, it, it is a very big deal. It really is. So, and uh, you all do a great job. Thanks. Thanks <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. On uh, public comment, Kathy, did we have any? No one signed up to speak. No. Okay. Any other web comments or? Just comment. Yes. Yes. Is uh, who does does she work for April or Michelle or Esther? Is Cassie here? Yes, I think both of April and Cassie. Okay. Yeah. Cassie, do you want to highlight this about Michelle? So one of the comments we received this month was through our new Google review push that we're doing and then this customer also emailed the board directly just to reiterate that Michelle McLean, one of our CSR threes, did an excellent job in helping them with all the issues that they had. Um, they had to wait. They had some issues with the online application process, but Michelle was able to turn an unhappy customer around to a happy customer, address the issues we were having with their online um, problems they were having, and then they left a satisfied customer, so much so that they sent the email to us, and we really appreciate that. So it, it takes, you know, a lot of times people, they'll complain, but it takes extra for someone to take the extra few minutes to come in and, and make a, a compliment too, yeah. so thank you. Okay, then. All right, we can uh, do departmental reports. We'll start with uh, public information. Patrick's uh, here. She'll provide an update on what's going on with the public information and all the other stuff. So, Kathy, yeah. short ballot. You're not down at the. Not, not down there. No, I went and voted. It was real quick. It wasn't a line. Huh? <laughs> and it stopped raining. So it stopped raining. So what? Are we got a crew out covering what a doubleheader at Western Hills? Uh, actually, it got canceled Did it get because canceled of rain. They out. moved it to yep. tomorrow okay. and Thursday. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to a couple things we have going on. I uh, wanted to give a shout out to Cable Ten who got recognized at uh, the Focus on Race Relations dinner a couple weeks mm -hmm. ago for their uh, support of the organization, the things that they're doing, and uh, being there uh, for events that they've done. And we've had uh, Ed and Christy Poe both on the show. We're trying to get Christy to come in and do a regular segment with us. So uh, we're looking forward to that. I appreciate all the work that they do. And that it's being recognized by organizations here in town. Um, last week, we met with the um, the Rotary Foundation met last week and went over all the applications okay. for uh, scholarships in the community. Um, three have been identified for the FPB Youth Scholarship, one from each of the public high schools. Um, Thursday night are the award ceremonies for both Franklin County and Western Hills. Uh, Mr. Snyder has agreed to present at Franklin County, I believe. Uh, Ms. Dutton Mitchell has agreed to present at uh, Frankfurt High School, which is June 9th in the morning. Uh, so, so if anybody's available Thursday night for Western Hills, mm -hmm. let me know. <laughs> and otherwise, I'll be there or Kathy Jennings will be there. Okay. We'll have someone there to take pictures as well. 
Uh, so we're excited to do that. Once once all of those have been, once the students find out that mm -hmm. they got it, then we'll announce who the winners are here at the at the board meeting, and then we're going to do a special about it on the show as well. Okay. Um, just to highlight what they are doing mm -hmm. and about the scholarship program in general, and why we think it's important. Um, we are in the thick of preparing for Expo. Uh, it's happening soon, uh, June second and third. Uh, you know, there was, uh, a, for several years we haven't had it here in town, but when it was here, uh, FPB did have a, have a presence there. We had a, a tent or a booth uh, to be there, just available to all of the people who come. Most of the people who are there are our customers, so we like to make ourselves available where our customers are to answer questions, um, give information out about new uh, programs we have, new products that we have, new services that we have. Got a very exciting one happening uh, that I think we'll be talking about later that we want to be able to provide information about. Yes. Uh, we've been posting uh, photos of the uh, construction of our little solar garden up there and uh, uh, are going to love when we have uh, more information to share with our customers because we've had a lot of interest in it. Uh, but anyway, back to Expo. Uh, we'll be there Friday and Saturday. Uh, we're I was telling uh, the managers yesterday that it's it's a all hands on deck situation because our uh, marketing and media services team have a lot of responsibilities for Expo because not only are we going to have the the tent there but we're also responsible for covering a lot of the events that are happening at Expo and um, so we're looking forward to it being really a, a good event for all of our employees to have the opportunity to participate in. We'll be giving out information also about ACP next band. Uh, and then all you know fun stuff things for the kids and stuff like that so uh, we're excited about that uh, also we'll be doing a live show on around 10 on that Friday morning live from Serafini's at the expo and uh, that'll be fun too uh, I think that's about it all I have for now if you have any questions any questions for Kathy Steve I do have one complaint that you know Kathy didn't tell me to hold my middle end when she took a picture of me oh. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. and uh, I just wish she had told me that that was happening <laughs> well I, I, a lot of the employees are learning that if I'm around you're probably gonna get your picture taken <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you all thank you Kevin. Vin? Okay. next we'll move to the network operations Senate and then our, our NOS director your NOS report is on the 95 and report good evening <clears throat> um, you'll see uh, April was a pretty busy month just like the rest it looks like the, uh, the network operations staff took 1,879 phone calls in April and we had 797 locates uh, so for the physical year that makes 7,167 locates so you know staying right on track it's it's spring summer so it's the busy season like everyone else <coughs> but everything else is going well you know we're staffed and still doing some training on the locate side so moving forward Any no questions for there no. Not right now. Okay. thank you sir okay next we'll move to customer service and we have Cassie back again our customer service report is on pages 97 to 101 good evening again uh, the customer service department touched about 8,000 customers this month and kept our wait times under a minute and um, we are still pushing people to our portal for our budget signups those continue for cycle two customers until May 24th we have approximately 320 people signed up for the cycle one that just recently closed on May the 11th um, is so that up or down or same or it's about the same, about the same. Um, however we did have some new growth on that and those people all but one used the portal so definitely our portal is advancing and all the different things that you can utilize it for. We have almost 15,000 customers signed up for the portal currently. Um, we'd like to encourage everyone to sign up for it because you can access so much information about your account. You can sign up for the budget. You can do a payment plan. Lots of options there for people. Um, so we're glad to see that they're utilizing that and they still have some time again if they're a Cycle 2 customer for our budget through <coughs> the 24th be happy to answer any questions you guys might have is the number of people uh, John and I were at physical court the other day and they were asking us questions about people 
uh, signing up for the assistance on NextBound Internet. Mm -hmm. Is that is there much change there? Or is it are we get, is it grown any or is it just staying about the same? The ACP I believe this month was close to 680. I don't have it right in front okay. of me, but that is about the same. About We're same. not having a lot of growth there. What we are seeing is that um, people are moving and as they move, they can <coughs> now again use the portal to relay that information because you have to transfer your benefit. It doesn't automatically transfer. And also ACP has hit the one year mark with the changes that were made. So people would probably want to watch email notifications to come from that provider, not necessarily FPD, um, but they may get an update of information requirement. When they hit the one year mark, they have to recertify. So they may need to you know, watch for that or if they see a change in their bill or their benefit change, look for those emails to see if they've gotten anything from ACP regarding that. Okay. Any questions for Cassie? Uh, where are we on the uh, the new phone system? Is it in the process of being built? To when are we going to uh, we approved recently? Is that is that uh, is that coming online next uh, in the coming months, or is it in the process of being built? We have a guest coming up from that yeah. side. <laughs> about three to four months out. Right, exactly. <laughs> so we started that engagement uh, yesterday. Uh, oh, as a okay. matter of fact, so it's yeah. going to be a twelve week engagement there to to build the parallel system, go through testing and everything there. Okay. Into twelve weeks, I'll be back. You know, getting everybody's blessing on where we're at. And then look to be actually moving over to that platform. So we're still a few months away, but we're on. You know, we got started. started okay, point. good. All right, next one. We are also started on our um, Paymentus that was approved, which will be our new payment vendor. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing weekly calls with them to uh, start the testing process for getting all of our imp information implemented into their system. Okay. Yeah, I screwed up in April. Save me on <laughs> that one. So. <laughs> okay. Any other questions for Cassie? <coughs> Thank you. Matt. All right, next will be your telecom report with the telecom superintendent, Adam Helen. Your telecom report is on pages 103 to 106 in your report package. Uh, good evening. Uh, the first uh, page of the report are the penetration numbers for the month. It looks like we broke 1,000 on NextBand subscribers, which is good. Uh, the next two pages are the outages for the month. We had two outages, uh, one in the Brighton Park, Cardinal Hills area was a, a node issue. Uh, the other out, uh, outage was a power supply that we had uh, gave us some problems in the Evergreen area off uh, Greenfields. Uh, trouble call was pretty average for the month. It's up just a tad, but it's, it's not bad. Uh, Next band, uh, update on that real quick. Uh, area overhead crews are finishing up Indian Hills. Uh, we actually launched last month part of Bentwoods, <coughs> and hopefully this week we'll launch the other half of Bentwoods and get that turned up, part of Thornhill, and actually uh, uh, downtown, the last little section of downtown that was left off because of the Second Street. We'll get that turned on hopefully uh, later <coughs> this week. So, are you happy to answer any questions? I might mention uh, Adam and I and John appeared in front of fiscal court, what, earlier, late last week? I last week, I guess? Yeah. Um, to review, you know, they have the 11 agreements to review. Uh, we were there, what, about an hour and a half. Um, asked a lot of questions. Uh, David Denton had prepared a, an extensive, detailed, nine-page uh, fact sheet of everything that happened since day one. Uh, they looked at it. I think it was a good session. Um, they tabled it, and they may have some additional questions. They will, but I think, I mean, I think the meeting went well, but at this point, uh, they have the 11 agreements to sign, so we're just waiting on them. And the important thing is, the end date doesn't change. So the clock's ticking. And the biggest thing, you know, John pointed out was, um, it's just a situation, they putting in three, we're putting in five, we're getting eight million match. Um, they've gotta be in or there's no deal. Because their three comes out, <coughs> you know, part of the agreement was you had to have a local partner and their three million help leverage it. If they don't go, then the project's over, so. John, did you want to add anything? Or? No, I mean, I, you know, I appreciate Adam coming with us and providing the technical expertise, but, you know, it was, um, you know, there was some um, concerns about communication, but I, I, I'm not, I'm not, quite honestly, I'm not sure how valid some of those concerns were, and, you know, I think we, uh, I think we were really hamstrung by the change in administration. You had lame duck folks that were on their way out and new people coming in, and, um, you know, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure how. You know, like you said, the ball is in their court, yeah. so we're going to see how they respond and whether they want to go through with it and whether they want to pony up that money or not. So we'll see. We're willing to do it if they're willing to work with us. So. So. 
and they've got the maps. They got David's fact sheet. I mean, yep. they got the Everything. agreements and anything else they need. So we'll just see where it goes. So yeah, you did a good job today, Adam. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And then we'll move to the electric department with the electric superintendent Scott Hudson. <coughs> the electric uh, department report is on pages one hundred seven to one hundred ten. As you will see on page 107 is our monthly SADI report. You'll see that we're still holding our 29.8 range. Uh, 108, once again, is our pie chart with the certain percentages for each type of outage. Uh, 109 has the uh, each one of those percentages broken down into how many outages was for each one of those slices of the pie. And then on page 110, you'll have your top 10 outages for the month. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Scott? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, next we'll have our Chief Electrical <coughs> Engineer, Travis Culler. We'll give the uh, update on AMI and uh, community solar. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we've got community solar on the agenda, so if you like, we can just cover that that then when we come to that item. Uh, AMI, pretty much still business as usual. We're getting a few hundred a month of electric and water devices. Um, our internal folks are installing those. That, that's going pretty well. Um, happy to answer any questions. What's our target in terms of the completion on? Yeah, we're about 50% done. Um, at the current run rates of about 500 electric a month and 250 water, we're looking at probably another 18 months, two years. Um, you know, it's uh, another 10,000 electric to go basically um, and somewhere, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood mm -hmm. for water. Um, so yeah, we, we got a ways to go. I'd like to go faster, but you know, we're making progress. Are we, but we're getting the equipment in on a regular basis now? We are. They missed one shipment, but they're making them up on the next month. So th there have been a couple hiccups, but in general, what they committed to us, they they honored. So, yeah. Any questions for Travis? Yep. Hey, Thanks, right. sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll give the CEPA report. That's on page 111, page 113 in your board package. You'll notice on page 111. For the month of March, we cleared $42,913, and then on <coughs> the 12th, you can see uh, month to month, the uh, market price compared to last year is down, so that's why you notice we're down a little further than we were last year. So, so far this year, we're, uh, we have cleared $211,906. <coughs> is that about where you, David, is that about where you thought we'd be in, about where we are headed for next year? Yes, sir. Yeah, it is. Okay. Any questions for Ben? Okay, next uh, we'll turn it over to Gary to give the KYMEA report. I really don't have a much new, except you have any common question. KYMEA is going to have a board meeting uh, this week, so we didn't have a meeting between that yet. And RWE is moving mm -hmm. along, right? I think they already have uh, um, many construction. Right. Um, Follow based on information provided by KYME staff, their major longest leading item is transformer. Those are already in order, supposed can do their own time. And uh, um, they're going to try to arrange um, kind of a start a ceremony like a in the July for groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't plan to make it really big. They also plan to win next June in operation make a really yeah. big. Okay. But it's up to you too. They ask the board if any of you have an interest or city city mayor or commission have an interest, they certainly will come. To the me. FBA, FPB plane is grounded, right? To go to uh, far <laughs> western Kentucky? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, they are really in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Close a small town, probably 20 minutes, 15 yeah. to 20 minutes, yes. Well, when you get to the maximum security prison, you're close, so, <laughs> yes. Uh, Gary, let me ask you a question. Yes, Gary, Gary will, uh, will this meeting, um, is will the rate be determined, will the, the uh, rate for next year, is it, will it be determined at this meeting or will it be determined at the June meeting? I think the last meeting they already voted for oh, it. That's for the it. Okay. exactly the one so we, we, we saw okay. you. Uh, okay. That's the which that's is right. actually we incorporate to the this study. Yeah, this study. You're going to right. see the presentation. So today. when we get to the 1898 report, that new rate that's built in there and yes, yes. That, that cost. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we'll move to the safety department with our safety director, John Lund, and uh, that would be 
115 Good afternoon, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Like Ben said, the safety report starts on page 115 and runs through page 116. For the month of April, we did sustain one OSHA recordable. Uh, water department employees sustained a lower back strain uh, from walking over some uneven ground. The injury resulted in some medical treatment, but the employee returned to work without any type of restrictions. And on our vehicle accident, um, somebody backed into one of our safety department trucks. Oh, was that right? That <laughs> did. It was parked at the cable building, and somebody backed into it, but no damage to our vehicle. So. Yeah. You hate it when that happens. You I hit did. the safety vehicle? I know. <laughs> came out, and I was like, oh, my goodness. But I have to answer any questions, sir. Any questions for Thank, you, Thank sir. you, sir. All right, next is the Water Distribution Department and the Water Distribution Superintendent. Brian Warren will give that report on pages 117 and 119. Good afternoon, board, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Water Distribution Month report is on pages 117 through 119. We had five, we installed five new services. We had seven main breaks and we had four water outages. Uh, besides our normal board report, um, we've started a line replacement project on New Street. Uh, we're wrapping up a line replacement project on Sandbar Lane, and our flushing program, we're about 30% complete on that. So, moving along. Any questions? Questions, Brian? Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, and then we'll <coughs> at our water treatment plants report with the superintendent, Brian uh, Brandon Powell. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> For the month of April, the water treatment plant treated 220,633,000 gallons of water for an average daily production of 7.35 million gallons per day. <clears throat> Lock 4 averaged 8,480 cubic feet per second for an average of 5.4 billion gallons of water. <clears throat> there was 1.8 inches of rain recorded in the watershed for the month of April. Uh, that's your questions if you have any. No chemicals this month? That's next month. Next month? <laughs> yeah. I'm about to jewel for you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, board, that wraps up our reports. Okay. Thanks, Fed. Um, action items, item 6.1. Consider approving a resolution of the FPB to accept the grant, approve the grant assistance agreement, authorizing amendment to FPB's budget, and naming an authorized representative to sign documents <coughs> associated with the $782,711 clean cleaner water program grant for the reservoir project david billings yes, sir i was going to do that tonight okay. for david he was he's had some other okay. other other commitments david david told me he said we're about two-thirds of the way to uh, to getting our check from these folks so uh, so that's good news basically the, the documents basically point mr <clears throat> cubine to uh, to execute the documents and it also has an opinion letter uh for me to submit uh, with uh, with the package, so I just ask that the ask for a motion to authorize the board and staff to execute Exhibit Four, uh, the uh, certificate of the recording officer, which basically says that you know, everything was done in accordance with open meetings and so forth, and and to authorize me to issue the the opinion letter. Okay, so, and this is a matter that's been before us before, and this is just executing the final agreement, yes, right? Yes, sir. Getting the just moving down. The, David said you're just moving down the down the process to okay. to getting the getting the funds. Does anybody have any questions for hands? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator, order. I make a motion that we uh, um, direct the uh, general counsel to submit Exhibit Four and uh, all the necessary documents. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. All those in favor, say aye. <coughs> aye. Those opposed. Uh, items approved. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next one. Consider draft community solar tariff and discuss public hearing. Travis, and then Jason, you and Catherine, just however y'all want to, after he presents, discuss whatever y'all want to on this. So, because I know y'all been following it. Travis. Yep. Good evening again, everyone. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we're getting very close on the community solar facility. If you take a peek outside, you can see we're we're making quite a bit of progress. <coughs> so hopefully. Um, and you've done all this after work by yourself, Yeah, just right in now. the evenings <laughs> yeah. I'll run up here and, and take care of it. No. Uh, solar energy you got your solutions. crashman ratchet set. And, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go into town. No, uh, Solar Energy Solutions is our vendor partner on that one. They've, they've been great to work with, done a really good job, very good communicating with me and keeping me up to date. So uh, very happy with them so far. Uh, but that brings us back to the topic at hand. Um, you know, as Kathy mentioned, customers are going to be eager to sign up here soon, so we need to get a, a tariff in place. Um, Staff has drafted a tariff for the board to consider. Uh, 
what we're proposing is two customer options, a month to month fee or a one time purchase fee. So the month to month would be essentially a 12 month agreement. You pay that, that 396 a month um, at the end of the 12 months. If you want to renew, you can, if not, those shares just go back into the, into the bucket essentially. Or you pay the one time fee of let me make sure I've got it right. I think it's 1049. 10, there was a 10, there was 49, 10, 70. 49, 70. Okay, there was a late revision, so the, <coughs> the actual packet may have the, the old number. But 104970 would be the one time fee, and then you would be entitled to the energy output of your units or shares, whatever you want to call them, uh, for a 25 year period. Uh, that so for one, me as a customer, what's that mean, Travis? If I'm a, I'm, you know, I've got regular service now, and I decide to go in and, <clears throat> and buy a unit or whatever. What does that mean for my bill? For sure, yep. So we're we're dividing the facility into 250 watt slices. It's not an actual 250 watt panel, but that's just a nice even number that we divided it up into 250 watt solar units. <clears throat> so for that one time fee or the monthly charge, however you so choose you're entitled to the energy output to be credited on your bill for your solar units or shares or however, however you want to call it. I think we're calling it units in the policy to uh, make, make it nice and clean that it's not a, an actual share you're purchasing. So we're, we're calling them solar units. So the energy output will monitor the output of the entire facility, divide it up into each of those, those solar units of 250 watts, and that credit will be applied to your bill. So for the average person, would that be, say my bill is uh, $150 a month electric? Sure. What would that mean to me? Okay, so for each share, say you're doing the month to month, mm -hmm. three, $3.96 a month entitles you to that <clears throat> energy output of that share. At the fiscal year 24 rates that we're proposing, which are obviously are not official, but we're going to discuss a little more later, that would be about... If you annualize it, so some months will be better, some months will be not as good, depending on the weather. But it would be about two thirty-one a month in credit to your bill. That's okay. what we're estimating. Um, and again, we we <coughs> base that price at three ninety-six on kind of the all-in cost. You know, we we discussed not passing any of the costs of this facilities off to the other customers. So what we looked at is the facility output cost, which is based mainly on the capital construction. We've got some maintenance costs in there as well as the distribution system cost to wheel that power across our system to the customer's meter. So that's how we arrived at that 396. And then again, the, the 231 average credit, um, that's based on for each 250 watt slice, we're, we're predicting how many kilowatt hours that'll produce <coughs> over a year, uh, which is a pretty standard estimate most, most solar facilities will output. We expect you'd get, a, again, about 231 per And KU's charge is what? About five dollars for a yep. share. Uh, I think it's five fifty or five fifty five. So uh, again, it, you know, we want it to be as competitive as we can be. But, you know, I feel like we we did pretty well at that number. And I know Jason, you worked real hard with Travis and Vin to get that number as low as you could. So yeah. Sure. And what was that once again? The one time fee. Yeah, ten forty nine seventy. So um, if you're doing a direct comparison with KU, uh, theirs I think is a little better. Um, I'm not sure how they arrived at that number exactly. <laughs> you know, they don't, that's not something they would publish. I think it's maybe they're applying a heavy discount to the, getting all the cash up front is the only thing I can assume. Because if you, if you stretch out their 555 a month for however many years, say 20, 25 years, it's obviously much higher than that. So my only <coughs> assumption would be as an investor owned, the way they look at cash flow, they're dis discounting that one-time price. Um, ours is just, when you look at the capital cost and the maintenance cost, that's what the one-time fee comes out to be. So we, di we didn't discount it any for having the cash flow up front, but I think some may do it that way, if that so makes sense. So you're saying 10.49.7 here, just to be clear, you're saying 1,000. Correct, $1,049.70, <laughs> yes. And that's for 25 years, right? You're entitled to the energy output output for 25 years and we also would propose that's how you know KU has a, a gifting program we think we leverage that for the gifting program um, I think there's they've had some success with work with like nonprofits for instance um, so you you could purchase the shares outright for one time and then gift those shares uh, to, you know, to customers in need um, so as far as timeline 
we had kind of talked about approving in parallel with the cost of service study i think uh, of course it's up to the board but we were going to propose uh, at the the uh, the budget meeting on the 31st yep. we would discuss further cost of service study uh, it suits the board we would do the public hearing then um, yep. with the the community solar policy as well well, we've got a, a several page document here in front of us with the terms and conditions that people Correct. would agree to. Sure. Catherine, if you and Jason feel this is yeah. where we need to be. Yeah, I, I just want to, so it's just on record. Uh, sure. And then you said that what you thought the credit amount would be for a <coughs> monthly basis. I assume that's a similar proportion on the annual or on the one time fee. Yeah, you would be getting the same share slice. So it's 250, a 250 watt slice <coughs> of the entire facility, whether you do monthly or one time. Um, so it would be the same same monthly credit yeah and again that's that's based on the expected fiscal year 24 rates which are not approved but that's uh, you know did, did you have be a number for that total lump credit estimate over 25 years um, yeah I, it, I, I don't know the exact number but I think it was in like the 700 ish dollar range um, I think that's so someone could basically spend a thousand dollars and roughly expect six ninety three is what it six comes out to. Okay, yeah. So someone could expect to get six ninety three <coughs> right over twenty five years. Yeah. If there's rate increases, that could be more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yep. Yes. Because you're offsetting your energy usage on your bill directly. It's kind of you know what we propose is essentially similar to the way we do net metering. You know, it's a, it's a one to one. We don't devalue that that credit, that solar credit. So. In theory, if if your standard residential electric rate goes up, that credit proportionally would go up as well. So at the end of 25 years, that 693 could be worth a whole lot more than that in terms of yes, that's a minimum. That's probably a minimum. Just so we're all clear, that differential is the green attribute. That they yeah. Get into. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think you know one of one of the best benefits of, of doing this project <coughs> is going to be for you know people are still going to do rooftop solar, but but if you care about solar energy and it's something you want to do and you don't have that option available to you um, that's why we're you know that's the primary driver for doing this um, again we we want the cost to be as competitive as possible but uh, you know, there's that aspect as well and so assuming we hold the hearing and, and if everything is approved comments and so forth sure. then when would we actually start marketing and letting people sign up and buy the shares yeah we would um, I think the regular June meeting is we're when talking we about maybe the, the, tariff. the 27th we mm -hmm. would vote to approve um, at that meeting then it would be official you know on the books people could formally sign up um, I think Kathy mentioned she's been kind of dropping hints you know posting pictures that kind of mm -hmm. stuff so some of the soft marketing <clears throat> she's already started um, I think it depends on the board's comfort level as far as discussing price um, if you want to wait till after the public hearing maybe that that would be yeah. prudent but uh, based on the, the demand we start to receive from Kathy, we've done a phase one, mm -hmm. we look at <coughs> phase two, three, and four. Yeah, yeah that, that's been the plan. Um, I don't know that we ever officially decided what that go no go point was. I mean, it's of course up to the board when, when you would like to proceed with those next phases, but you know, we're going to be ready to roll. Uh, they cleared the entire four, phase, four phases of the site, uh, all four phases will be fenced in. Our transformer, our load center, switch gear, all that other good stuff um, will be sized for all four phases so um, I think we're going to be <clears throat> in a pretty good position to, to keep yeah. rolling on and informally we've communicated to both the city and the KSU that you know if, if we don't fully sell out on phase one if they're interested in it and <coughs> they're interested in pointing phases two three or four that that's available and obviously that you know there there's there seems to be some interest there but they want to see the final rates also so well, and as we discussed, that yeah. creates a little bit of a demand. Mm -hmm. yeah. If people want to get in, they should get in. Sure. Early, so. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and now, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Uh, how, how tall is the fence going to be back? I rolled back there, and it just looks like it's pretty close yeah. to the to the to the street. How tall is it going to be? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think mean, it, it, was looks, a, it looks real, you know, bummer. Uh Yeah, I think it was a six foot fence. Um, we were a little concerned about going any shorter than that because it's an electrical facility yeah. you know uh, the public safety, <coughs> safety aspect of that um but yeah i think i think it's gonna be six feet well, i'm think. thinking higher actually I'm gonna oh, okay I mean, <laughs> yeah. it, it just looks um yeah if the board so you think maybe safety concerns as far as people well i mean just kind of throwing i mean it's so close you could almost 
Is there a standard we'll recommended height for those type facilities? No. Yeah, I don't know that there's any necessarily like code requirement that we have to adhere to. Um, on substations, we go, you know, we go taller, but that's you know kind of a, a different <coughs> animal. Um, you know, we we can explore other options, or if maybe if you know that the street side mm -hmm. section maybe needs a little more. I mean, that's, I'm we, just, I mean, I rolled back and I just was struck on how close it was. If you could just take a rock and just you know do that with it and. Okay, yeah, if you'd like, we can, I can talk it over with Solar Energy and see if they have, you know, if there's. Well, then maybe David also maybe check with our insurance carrier also and see if they have any recommendation. Right. Yeah. So, uh, just, just as a, uh, I think we're trying to balance sort of the aesthetics of mm -hmm. the show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 As opposed to, you know, and, and, and the good thing is, I mean, from what I know with Solar, it, they actually, it's like kind of your iPhone mm -hmm. case, mm -hmm. uh, your iPhone where you can like hit it's it really, a, yeah. really hard and mm -hmm. then do anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've heard, I think, some studies <coughs> dropping bowling balls on them and stuff like that. So I, I think we're in pretty good shape from that point of view. Um, you definitely want to have a fence because it is a live system. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah. But it looks, I think the fence looks yeah. very good. Yeah, I mean, so what they have so far, uh, yeah, I think it, I mean, it blends pretty well. From yeah, it's just, I wish the panels could be the other direction. You could just turn them all around. I'm sure we could. <laughs> uh, they just don't work as well that way. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Chair. Um, sure. And we did discuss the fence issue. In fact, we took off. Um, the razor wire. The oh, razor wire. Yeah. I mean, so, but, I mean, obviously if we need to look at it again, but I would hate for that, us to change what, it. That's just what point. struck me when I rolled back. If it's okay, it's fine with me. I just, that's just, I thought of me as a mm -hmm. 12, 15 year old person <laughs> walking. Hopefully, we just have the state workers that we have to get in with the drop pass. It's know. kind of a low bar, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what else? Travis, you mentioned the um, gifting program. <coughs> that's not in this um, um, agreement yet. Yeah, yeah right? I, I don't know that it's specifically spelled out as a gifting agreement maybe we could clean up that language a little bit but the the one-time transfer of your shares that was that was the concept we were trying to so someone can purchase shares and, and transfer them <coughs> some sort of ownership okay. So if we if we were to address more directly opportunities um, for low income, we would need to do it by policy and some other program for credits or things like that. Yeah, I think you know. Of course, you may have to make a policy change. Um, I think any way we could leverage other funds to do that. Obviously, it keeps it more competitive for. You know the rest of the ratepayers or the rest of the subscribers. Um, you know I've I've seen um, some of the emails from like Department of Energy uh, that they're trying to set something up with light heat funds. Um, so that might be an option down the road we can explore. I, I don't know if that that's finalized. Um, most of the most of the example policies I looked at that. Um, that had a specific low income <coughs> carve out. It looked like a lot of those were leveraging other agencies uh, to close that gap. So I think that would that would probably be our recommendation. See if there's some other agency that can uh, chip in on that. Um, so how would the LAHI, do you have much detail on that? So for example, like community action agency that runs that. Yeah. So like when we come to that season, people sign up rather than signing up to get whatever amount of benefit they're eligible for applied to their bill they could get so many shares of this and then that credit would apply to their bill for a year or whatever. Yeah, I, I think that's the concept. I don't know if they've okay. formally announced any rules. I know, you you know, they've, they've got like a one pager website set up mm -hmm. that, you know, it's something they're working on, but, um, or there may be other programs, but yeah, I mean, that one seems like a, a pretty logical choice yeah. being, I mean, they're already paying, <clears throat> some, you know, somebody's bill. Right. 
that, that would be kind of from our perspective how we would address low income. Um, there's not a specific carve out in the policy. If the board, you know, wants wants to do that, of course we can. Um, Hans, what what about if you if it was sold to a nonprofit, you know, and then it was, you know, benefited low income that way. So then like tra the nonprofit then transfer it to a particular. If a nonprofit transferred to its customers, but if a nonprofit is held to interest to serve to serve its constituency, that may be all right. So for example, the part here where it talks about on page three, like say Steve bought fifty shares and he wanted to give it to Bluegrass Community Action. Under our policy he could do that. Yeah, one time one time he could give it, but then Bluegrass couldn't give it to an individual customer. But Bluegrass could use it to reduce their own energy bills and reduce their operating costs yes, and save on their budget, which would, in theory, free up dollars in their budget that they could help other people. Yes, one, the, the one time. Yeah. And they would execute, I think they would execute a new agreement with us once, they, once the, the transfer, transfer again. But someone could do it, for example, to the Sunshine Center, could do it to K State, could do it to uh, uh, Red Cross, I mean, anybody they wanted to, right? Yes, At one time. Well, I mean, it, obviously we're interested, so keep if somebody could keep their eyes and sure. ears open for the, any federal mm -hmm. funding opportunities mm -hmm. or grants, sure. that would be great. Um, and I'm just excited that the, the public can now look at this and it's be prepared for the public hearing, um, and we can get rolling. It's happening. Yeah. <laughs> literally happening. Yes, it is. It's literally <laughs> as we yeah. speak. So at this point, Travis, we're going to – if we adopt this, then we'll be also adopting having the public hearing on the 31st. Then if any board member or anybody listening in, customer, anyone else wants to submit comments, we can consider them. And then we'd adopt the final document with any changes to this at that time, right? Um, I, I think the plan was public hearing on the 31st of May and then bring it back the final time right, June, June 27th. June 27th, yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, if the board likes, we could go ahead and start sharing the uh, the policy now, you know, put it on the website, whatever, however the board would yeah, like I us think, to. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's fine. I mean, we want to get as many comments as we can if sure. you have ideas or suggestions. Yeah. Okay. So the motion would be to accept this as a draft and schedule it for public hearing. Correct. And that's the action we're taking right now. Yes. Correct. Okay. And yeah. publish it on the FPB website. Mm -hmm. Yes. And to share it on the FPB website. And anybody else, you or Kathy Lindsay, think, you know, when you're out talking, you know, if you want to talk about on Cable 10, you're out talking to Qantas or whatever. Sure. Can tell people what's coming. Okay, great, yeah. Okay. So do we have a motion? Uh, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Ms. Mitchell? Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It's adopted. Travis, good work on it. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> so this is what you've been doing in your spare time? Huh? Yep, Working on yep. Uh, right up here with the, you know, the, the wrenches. And <laughs> okay. You just go stay up there, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I might, yeah, might as well. Yeah. Item 6.3, consider acceptance of 1898 company cost of service and rate report and discuss dates for a public hearing. And in the words of Ralph Ludwig, who chaired this board for years, we're accepting the report. We're not approving it or adopting it. We're accepting it. Correct. We're going to get an overview tonight. Correct. And then we'll have a public hearing on this, take comments and so forth. Right. Same process we just talked about. Yep, June exactly. 27th, we... In front of us, but this is this has been in the make in the work for some time. Yes, quite and some so time. So tonight we're going to get an overview of what's in it, Correct. and then yes. this will also be posted on the website for people to review and yeah. so forth. Yeah, assuming the board accepts it yeah. into the record, however you know yeah. we like to phrase it. Um, but yes, that that's the proposed plan. If the board would like and just to make sure when we vote to accept, we're not approving <clears throat> it or adopting. We're right. just saying we've got it, and we're going to make it public and scheduled for public hearing. Right. There there are some potential. Proposed rate changes to be mm -hmm. considered. We're not asking to approve any rate changes tonight. Just uh, accept that they've been yeah. uh, presented to the board for consideration and will be heard at a public hearing. Ralph explained that motion to me. It took me a year to figure it out, but I finally, <laughs> I finally got it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think it works works pretty well now. So, yeah. Uh, again, I, well, I said I was going to stand up here, but I'm going <laughs> to get out of the way pretty. 
pretty quick. Um, Craig Brown is, is back with us tonight. Um, you, I mean, you probably remember Craig <coughs> yes. from about, probably about this time last year, did a rate study for us. Uh, last time we did kind of a, what I would call a limited rate study. We just looked at a few specific parts and pieces. This go round, uh, a full comprehensive cost of service study and rate design proposal. Uh, Craig's gonna <coughs> present to you. He's got a lot to cover. So again, I'll just, I'll step out of his way and let him dive right in. And Travis, when was the last time we did a rate study? 2013 was the, the last comprehensive, you know, <clears throat> full cost of service study. Yep. Perfect, thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, good to see you all again. Yeah. Uh, again, my name is Craig Brown with 1898 and Co. We see you about once a year, don't we? Yeah, uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna see more. I'll be back <laughs> in about a month. You get to see my boss in a couple weeks, yeah. so. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're gonna go over uh, the rate study today. Uh, we'll talk about the rate study process in general. Uh, we'll step through the test year revenue requirement, which kind of forms the basis of what we did. Uh, walk through what a cost of service study does. A little bit of a rate design concepts and kind of primer on rate design in general. Um, we're gonna walk through our recommendations and we've got a section on the end on some new purpose standards. So I wanted to start with just kind of a overview of the rate study process, just how the rate making process flows. It's, it's generally a, a three-step process. Um, step one is kind of a financial planning stage. You can also think about this as figuring out your revenue and revenue requirements or a financial forecast. This you actually do in-house. And usually um, this is kind of to determine what's the overall system average increase you need. Um, we stepped in at, at phase two and three in this process we, with the cost of service. That's where you're actually allocating the cost to each of the customer classes, figuring out if, you're, if your costs are equitable among the classes and figuring out you know, of that system average increase, how should that be spread to the classes? And then finally, the third step is rate design, where you're taking that uh, and kind of develop target revenues for each class, and you're actually figuring out how to price that differently. And, and you can actually use the, the cost of service study results. We'll talk about how that can actually be used in rate design decisions. So we started with, um, oops, with just the test year revenue requirements. We didn't actually do a forecast. Travis has, kind of has a model he does that lays out the five-year plan for costs. So, the transition, we'll, we'll use interchangeably, you know, test your revenue requirements, test your cost of service. It's basically a, a one-year snapshot of the amount that needs to be recovered in rates. And, and you all do that on a utility basis, which means you're capturing your, your own M cost, your administrative in general, and you cap, you've considered depreciation and return, not like actual debt service payments and capital uh, paid with cash. Um, but we take all those operating costs, including depreciation, give you kind of your gross cost of service. We'll subtract off other revenue sources such as fees and contributions, penalties, and that'll give us our net revenue requirement. And that's basically the amount you need to recover in rates each year. Um, and you'll see at the bottom, uh, we're using a forward looking test year. So we're look looking at this for the fiscal year 24 budget amounts or projected amounts. Um, and you'll see based on existing rates, you generate 62 million versus a revenue requirement of 63.6 which means you have net income is negative currently um, based on this projection. The biggest thing driving that is the power supply cost. We, we have heard a little bit about that earlier. I believe it jumped from about 41 million to 46 is projected for next year. So that's really what's driving this. Um, and so it's about you know, over a 10% in increase from KYMEA. So the cost of service study process in general. So it's, it, it's a three-step process within the three-step process, but um, we, we work through three steps of functionalization, classification, and allocation. So we, we start with that, that revenue requirement of the test year cost of service. And you can see on, on a utility basis, that's those same categories we just looked at of power supply cost being the biggest one. You have your O&M, your administrative in general, depreciation, and you'd subtract off other revenue. Now the first step, functionalization talks, figures out what portion of the system are we talking about. Um, so power supply in your case kind of includes both production or generation and transmission to your system. So there is, you also have a transmission function within your system, the high voltage network. Um, the majority of the, the FPB costs are related to distribution. So you basically are operating the distribution system around the, the city. And then there's also customer direct to class. So 
customer service, that would be functionalized as customer. Um, the other way we look at this, and actually we kind of look at these in parallel, is we classify cost based on the cost causative factors. And we'll, we'll look at each of these costs and, and <coughs> think about do these costs vary with energy or the number of kilowatt hours on the system? Is it a cost that changes based on peak demand? Um, for example, when you size a transformer, you build a substation, you're, you're sizing that to serve the peak demand that's going to happen at any time, not the number of kilowatt hours that flow through the system. So that's a lot of costs in a, in a utility are actually demand related more than energy related. Um, and there's customer related cost or classification. So costs that are classified by customer would be the meters themselves, the service drop. Um, anything related to customer service, things like that. Those are all classified as things that would change based on the number of customers on the system, not the peak demand or not the kilowatt hours sold. And then once we have costs functionalized and classified, um, that's when we take those costs, we'll almost have them in buckets, and then we'll spread those buckets <coughs> to the customer class um, using allocation factors. And those allocation factors are built on the concepts of cost classification. So we'll develop allocation factors based on the number of kilowatt hours for each customer class or certain types of peak demand, coincident peak, non-coincident peak for the classes, or simply spread based on the number of customers. And ultimately when that all comes back together, that's how we get our, what we call our unbundled cost of service. So the unbundled revenue requirement, if you look at the header, You'll, you'll kind of see we have a combination of that functionalization step and the classification step. So you'll see power supply, transmission, distribution, and customer. That's the functionals. And then you see on the second row, you'll see energy, demand, or customer. We also have lighting, which is kind of a, a hybrid of customer. Um, so this is kind of going through that process in general, in, you know, in totality, where we combine those first two steps. Power supply. Uh, we determine if it's energy related or demand related based on how you're charged. Most of it comes through as a demand charge, so we'll classify those as power supply demand. The energy rate will classify as power supply energy, <coughs> and the transmission charge pieces of your KYME bill will classify as transmission. Um, as far as the classifications, they're pretty standardized in the industry, so we follow uh, the Na NARUC, which is the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, electric cost allocation manual. So there's an industry standard workbook that defines how costs are classified and allocated for the most part. Um, you know, a lot of these costs will be, it, it, simply in the, the chart of accounts, it'll identify what they are in the accounting records, especially if you go to a large utility that uses the FERC chart of account, it's kind of done for you. But within that also, we know that production costs are gonna be either energy or demand related. We know that transmission costs are always demand related. And we know that distribution costs are either demand or customer related. And so we kind of know from the start where these are going to line up. And it's a lot of what the study is identifying, what's unique to your system and what's specific about that. And then what are the actual allocation factors resulting from that process. So at this point, looking at the bottom of the net revenue requirement, we've taken the original 63.6 million total test your cost of service and we functionalized it and classified it. Can I ask you a question just Absolutely. for somebody watching at home or who might mm -hmm. want to testify a public hearing? I'm just sitting at home watching this, which I don't know why people are doing it, <laughs> but I'm watching this. Why do all this? Why not just leave it the way it is or just say, here's the amount per kilowatt hour, and if you're a residential user, you use less. If you're a big user, you use more, you pay more. Why just simplify and make everybody pay the same? Yeah. It's really about making sure the costs are equitable. Okay. And when we get to the rate design primer, we're going to see that, um, actually in cost service too, the majority of costs aren't energy related, but that's how typically utilities charge. Usually there's a customer charge and an energy charge. The, ener the part of your actual costs that are energy related are quite small relative to the energy charges. So it's about finding that balance between getting rate design, um, mm -hmm. using, and we, and we break up in customer classes because most people are the same within the class. Um, but it really drives that equity and being able to measure and say, yes, our rates are fair um, because we've done the study and this is kind of helps prove that out. And if they're not fully equitable, you can make directional changes to, to improve that. Okay. okay, I know this is an eye chart. I'm not gonna talk specifically about the numbers. It's in the report. Um, but this shows, what I wanted to show with this is the, this is the kind of the allocation factor phase. 
Um, so you'll now see across the top we have our, our customer classes, residential, general service, large power, large industrial high load factor, and then your gratis and municipal rates, and then lighting. What you will see on here is we have different, we have the classifications again. We have demand related allocation factors, customer related allocation factors, and energy. Um, and the demand really comes into two types of demand. We talk about coincident peak demand and non-coincident peak demand. Um, coincident peak demand means whenever the system peaks as a whole, which is basically when your KYME bill is set each month, whatever that class is loaded at that time is their coincident peak. Now, non-coincident peak is when the class peaks regardless of what it is. So whenever all the customers, whatever the maximum is for those, all the people in that class peak, regardless of the system, that's non-coincident peak. And there's actually a step behind, beyond that that's kind of a di maximum diversified peak, which is all the individual customers peaking whenever. So um, the reason we do this is because you build your facilities for certain reasons. Um, generation facilities are, are sized for coincident peak transmission as well. You're not, and, and the further you get away from the generation to the customer, it becomes more diversified. Um, so that's why when you're building a, say you're sizing a transformer, it's really down to just the few customers they're gonna use that in their non-coincident peak. So um, the further you get towards the customer, the more diversified it becomes. And that's why we'll use different measures of, of coincident peak or non-coincident peak to find an appropriate allocation factor. Now, as we heard earlier, AMI is not fully implemented yet, so we don't have the exact measurements for your customer classes. Um, so what I typically do and I did for you is we'll look to a neighboring utility. In this case, I looked at the rate case files for um, lg and &E and KU and, and basically looked at CP and NCP load factors and, and basically saw a general profile for each class size similar to yours and kind of benchmarked it from that, pulled some information from um, billing data and in general, just our experience to kind of scale that to make sure it looks right. So there's a few steps in there where we kind of, a lot, there's a lot in the model where we actually develop the allocation factors and there's more in the report. Um, this kind of jumps to the end and, and showing what the results are. So at this point, we've taken each of those functionalized and classified costs, brought them to the customer classes. And at this point, we start comparing their allocated cost of service with the revenue they currently generate. And if you look at the top, um, because we're using a utility basis, we look at the concept of return. And uh, typically for now, you would be return on rate base. Um, rate base is primarily net plant, so original cost, less accumulated depreciation. <coughs> um, and then there's a lot of other things like deferred income taxes. There's a little bit for cash working capital. There's a whole lot of other things that go into rate base. Um, generally, for municipal utilities, we'll just focus on net plant because that's almost all of what rate base is. So return on net plant is your net income as a percentage of net plant. And we saw that net income is currently negative for the test year. So on a system basis, we're at negative 3%. And then you can kind of see relatively where the other classes are, whether they're <coughs> above or below that. Um, to benchmark what is appropriate for revenue requirements, we look at so what's an appropriate rate of return? Now it does get, I have to be careful when I talk to municipals about return because rate of return and return in general is not profit. It's the money you spend on your capital projects. It's how you pay your debt service. So a measure of re equalized rate of return is, is what's giving you the money to do those projects and continue to operate your utility. Um, based on rate cases I've been involved with and looking at, you know, lg &E, KU, a lot of, Regulated rate of returns I've seen have been in the seven to high seven, eight percent range. Um, so for you, I just benchmarked a seven percent target for rate of return. And based on that plant, that's going to say your return should be 3.2 million right there. And with, since you're at 1.5 million negative now, that shows the revenue deficiency or the target rate increase is 4.8 million dollars. And that comes to a 7.8% rate increase. Again, this is still just the cost of service phase. But this, this gets us to an important point as well. 
of that 7.8% system average on that bottom row, you can show what the indicated rate increase would be to get each class two cost of service where everyone has the same rate of return. And this is where we start to draw some conclusions and, and start thinking about where we take this from here. Um, the things that stand out to me, um, residential shows the big for the, the really the biggest increase. 19% would get them to a 7% rate of return for the class. Um, lighting is kind of an outlier as well. Um, but also the two largest classes, large power and large industrial high load factor, are, are show the need for no adjustment or a rate decrease. Now, this is still just cost of service results. This is not to be taken as gospel. But it does inform the decisions you all should be making going forward. Um, and we, we, our goal is usually to take this and if you're going to make changes, use this to inform directional changes to get things closer to cost of service. Um, typical rate design principles such as gradualism say you're not gonna jump to something like this and adjust them all at once. Uh, the other thing that a cost of service is valuable for, and this kind of gets to both the, how cost of service is used in rate design, is we look at unit costs of service. So we have the unbundled rates by class, we also have them identified as energy demand or customer related. If you take, for example, the customer related cost for each class divided by the number of bills in a year, that tells you what the cost based customer charge would be. Likewise, if you take the demand related cost divided by the demand units, that's your cost based demand charge. And same way with energy. So what we can draw from this is if you look at this row up here is the cost based energy charge kind of gets to your point earlier. If you had a purely academic rate design, everyone's energy charge would be 3.25 cents per kilowatt hour, and the rest would be recovered in a demand or customer charge because electric utilities are a fixed cost business and you're recovering an energy charge, like most people do. Um, the demand charge you see for the ones that have demand units is around $19. Usually the one that's most interesting, and we actually did use this, is the gray circle um, by looking at the unit cost of service for customer costs, this tells you what your customer charge would be on a purely cost basis. So you can see residential is about 18, goes to 27 for small general, and then about 179 for the larger classes. I'm moving for, through this at a fairly rapid clip. Is there any questions as before we, or should I keep going? Okay, you guys just have it all down. <laughs> Okay, so we've looked at the cost service results. We've looked at the unit costs. This is where we'll, we'll sit down with the management team and, and talk through recommendations for how these rate increases should be applied. Now, the first decision that was made is we're not, not to do a 7.8% increase in one year. That's going to be split over two years of 3.9% each. So it's not, so fiscal year 25 starting July, recommendation is a 3.9%. And again, in fiscal year 25 in July of 2024, there'll be another 3.9%. So they've, they've taken that in two steps. Um, usually when I'm looking at classes that show a pretty significant variance from the other classes, such as we have with residential and lighting, I'll put a cap on it and say it should be no more than X percent above the system average. Um, in this case, we, we chose 150%. And, and that range kind of depends on you know, how big the rate increase is and how big the difference is. You know, if it was a 1% a increase, I would probably go more than 150%. But I think this kind of felt like a sweet spot for you. Residential, obviously, is always a concern um, with affordability. And anytime you, you're giving them the biggest piece of the pie, that's going to be hard to communicate. What percent of our customers are the residential? It's what, about fifth? It's a pretty significant. Yeah. I've got it. Just give me a minute. It'd take a second. Okay. Like yeah. And Gary, you might just, or Vent, we've had, when he's talking about the rates, up until June 30th, we've had the surcharge that KYME had, had on. And that's going away, right? Correct. And the that's being absorbed first. in yeah. this rate. The base rate. So, in fact, it's not a true 3.9%, right? From where we are right now today. Actually, that, so. is, that is true. And actually, when I, when I show you mean, comparisons later in this report. Okay, I'm sorry. No, that's right, that's fine. But they're actually gonna be better than what's shown because they can assume the adjustment is out. Right. So, yes. So it'll be definitely less of an impact in year one. 
So to answer your, Mr. Cubine, seventy-six percent of our customer base—that's just uh, just under sixteen thousand seven hundred customers—are residential. Okay. They do represent thirty-six percent of total revenue. When you look at um, commercial, let's look at sorry, large power, twenty-nine percent of total revenue. Uh, represented by about uh, just one percent of customer base, so it's okay. the, the customer count uh, is not so much as as demand and energy. Right. So this is this is kind of our target revenue percent. This is our recommended adjustments for each class for each, both years. Um, the first column repeats the indicated cost of service results, which is the adjustment to get them all the way to a seven percent return. Um, we're recommending one hundred and fifty percent of the system average, or five point eight five percent for residential. Um, a system average for general service, skip the large ones, a little bit higher than system average for the gratis and municipal rates because they're under collecting relative to the rest, um, and then lighting again 150%. The way we got to the 2.16 and the 2.0% for large power is basically whatever was left over, we wanted to give them below the system average, and that's basically the percentage that got us exactly to 3.9%. So by giving some classes more, you're able to give some less, and that's appropriately making directional changes based on the cost of service study. Now based on the, the, the fact that it's, this is a methodology in terms of looking at everything and measuring everything, from this board's perspective, what kind of discretion does this board have to say, you know what, we don't want residential to go up that high? You have all of it. Then You are the regulator, it's completely your choice. But then that in fact means someone else has to get an increase, right? Yeah. Because you're still at that $63 million you, figure. You could say, and, and, the, and I'm not, this actually, this does happen. Yeah. You could say, I acknowledge the cost of service study. I acknowledge that it shows the residential is under recovering relative to other classes and give everyone the same 3.9%. That's your, that's your ability as a regulating agency and that's your decision to make. But at the end of the day, we've got to generate $63 million. Correct. So yeah, it's kind of a zero sum game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll kind of use that as a transition into rate design. Just a three quick slides, kind of a primer on rate design in general. Um, you know, we talked about the, the customer charge and energy charge, and even the, the customer charge, demand charge, energy charge, those were created in the 1800s. And it's like the, the, that, you know, type of rate design, even with the demand charge, dates back that far. And they've endured over time, because basically all customers have been similar. Um, as we get into an evolving electric utility where people use the system differently and we're trying to integrate more customer-based generation onto the system. Um, it doesn't work quite as well, so we have to think things differently. doesn't mean you have to change things, but it, it, it makes it harder for you all to, to understand what's going, you know, to think through the equity portion of it. So we talked about, you know, the fixed and variable costs. So basically, your, your customer and demand costs are fixed and your energy costs are basically variable. Um, things that vary based on the number of customers, you know, billing, meter reading, some distribution facilities, um, some field equipment like meters and services, and even actually there's pieces of transformers that are customer related. Um, demand costs are the ones that vary with peak demand. And energy, you know, costs are the ones that should be based on things that change with kilowatt hour sales. So your variable fuel generation type costs. Now, What's common and typical with utilities is, you know, you, your, your costs on the left, you have variable energy cost, and then power supply capacity and transmission and distribution and customer are all fixed. If you took at what your typical utility rates are, um, all those fixed costs for the most part are recovered in a variable cost, and there's a customer charge that may or may not actually recover customer costs. So it's just a dynamic you should be aware of as we think about how this is going forward to know that there's not, you know, we wouldn't recommend going to the extreme <laughs> where you have the pure academic, but there's, there's consideration there as you go forward. So our goals as we, as we went through to make recommendations uh, for FPB was, um, one, we wanted to reduce interclass subsidies based on the cost of service study. We wanted to make even within that, once we have those target revenues, we also wanted to improve the fixed cost recovery and fixed charges and reduce reliance on variable rates or non-variable costs. Um, a couple things that came out of last year's rate study, 
uh, creation of a new general service demand class, so something that's going to bridge the current general service class and that jump to the large power class. So that's been created as part of this study. Um, restructuring the large industrial high load factor class. So instead of just being cheaper than large power, they actually shifted to where the demand charge is higher and the energy charge is lower. Um, so basically that's going to give more of an incentive to increase load factor and more of a reward for the customer. And then we looked at um, the concept of gratis and municipal rates and whether that should be um, appropriate for consideration. And in general, our recommendation is saying they're not necessary per se, but if you are going to keep them, I think there should be the creation of a, a de demand rate within there. So there's a municipal demand rate and a gratis demand rate. So for example, take the city of Frankfurt or the public school system. Mm -hmm. Where do they go under this, under what you're describing? Uh, they would go to the, either the app pool general service or the new general service demand class. They would be slotted into a new rate based on their load, okay. based on their peak demand. Is that normally, I mean, you said you looked at KU and some of the others, is that what they're doing? So or? for the most part, investor owned utilities will not have and use rates, you know, the, you'll occasionally see a school rate or a church rate. Um, municipal facilities generally do not, they just pay normal rates. But municipal utilities often have them and they choose to charge themselves less, especially if it's not so much you, but if it's the city council doing the uh, mm -hmm. thing, they will definitely choose to charge themselves less. So there's nothing wrong with the way you're doing it today. Um, and, and I, you know, I mean, I'm kind of a cost causation hawk and I, so I, I look at that a lot better. I'm like, it's. I'm not big on end use rates, so I don't think it's necessary to, to pick winners and say, we'll charge you less because you're a municipal government. Um, but there's nothing wrong for you to continue doing that. My biggest recommendation is if you're going to continue doing that, install the demand rate within there. And I think that would solve some of the equity with, with other classes. And especially as you get into things with like EV chargers and things like that, cost recovery could get severely out of the line on some of those without a demand rate in there. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, so we're gonna jump to recommendations for each class. Um, so we talked about residential is a 5.85% increase over current recovery. Um, then that includes for fiscal 24, the, P the current PCA would go away. Um, the biggest change here is we're trying to use the results of the cost of service study to target more fixed cost recovery in the customer charge. So currently at 1145, we're scaling it up to 18, which is the cost-based customer charge by 2025, kind of splitting the difference in between. And that effectively keeps the energy charge fairly level. So most of, the, most of that 5.85% goes in the customer charge, and then you have less of an impact on the energy charge. And you can see the, the rate, depending on scaling it from 600 all the way up to 2000, it, it comes in, you know, $5 up to $8 um, per month impact. And that's like this comparison, that's without the PCA. So that's, if the PCA is in there now, if we put that in this comparison, these would be a lot closer for fiscal year 24. But basically we set the target for where we wanted the customer charge and basically solved to get the rest of it in the energy charge. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. This existing step. Our PCA now, I know we added on, had to add on to it. Our PCA now is what? Six dollars seventy-five cents. Okay. So that's the equivalent to the residential one thousand, mm -hmm. uh, which is six dollars seventy-five. Is right. one thousand. Right. So it'd be six dollars. Six six point seven five cents. Six dollars seventy-five cents. Six dollars seventy-five. So if you look at uh, his presentation on the thousand kilo hour, uh -huh. is the rate increases six dollars thirty-four. Right. So the P ECA actually is higher than that. Right. C ECA so for, is a six dollars seventy five. So I think that I think that's a very important mm -hmm. point. You know, you know, you mentioned the PCA is not included in mm -hmm. these calculations. So, you know, what people are paying right now, if we put this through, if we if we go along with this for the first year, that first year your bill is essentially going to stay the same if you're at a, at a hundred at a hundred kilowatt hours. Correct. So I mean. And then, and then the increase would take place. The increase would take place in the next year. Um, you know, more legitimate increase would take place the next year. But people are, with us having to put this PCA on, we they are they are paying that now on their existing bill. 
So I just want to make sure that with that point was clear. I mean, you made it, but I, I, I you know, you made you s certainly said the PCA is not included in this. But I, I want to, I want to stress to people what that PCA is mm -hmm. for that hundred kilowatt, and that you know the net effect of for for the residential is really not that so much of an effect thing, yeah. in the first year. Correct. So, so bottom line is, assuming my consumption, my utilization stays the same, mm -hmm. what my bill is on May fifteenth of this year. And what my bill will be on August 15th, assuming I'm using, I don't use any more electricity, I'm using the same amount, is in essence be the same. It, it, it'll vary by usage. Right. So at a thousand dollar kilowatt hours, it'll kilowatt be right hours, about yeah. break even. Yeah. Because there's a little bit more in the customer charge mm -hmm. versus the right. energy charge, means you will see a slight variance the, the less right. you use versus the more you use. Right. But overall, as a class, yeah, the revenue Because the average person is just going to say, is, What's this mean to me on my bill? Right. And, and very what little, have to write very a little for this year. Yeah. 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 They don't, the average person doesn't care how you get to it. They just want to know how much that check's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And now, if it's going up, they are interested in how you got to it. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. So general service, uh, again, 3.9, so right at the system average for this class. We've used, the, again, used the cost of service as a guide to increase customer charges, putting most of the increase for that. Um, and you'll notice, actually, even in fiscal year 24, uh, there's no change in the energy charge. So actually, by increasing the customer charge by $5.50, that resulted in exactly a change in 3.9% of revenue. So uh, the energy charge just stayed the same for the first year. So customers will actually see their energy charge go down, um, you know, with the PCA going away. And then on the following year, when we jump to 27, which is right about the cost of service basis for the customer charge, um, the energy charge goes up a bit from like 9.6 to 9.8 cents. So again, a real small change in the energy charge, mostly just a, a trying to recover customer costs appropriately. And you can see for the first year, like I said, it's because there was nothing changed with the energy, it's just 550 on whatever the difference is, and then that'll vary with the PCA. Okay, okay. so we, we created a new rate class, and one of the studies from last year was the need to bridge that gap between general service and large power. You've got small commercial customers on general service, and it stops at 50 kW, and then it jumps straight into the large power class. Um, so there was a problem with any time a customer would be right on that borderline and they jump, they'd see their bills go up quite a bit, like 20, 30% at least. Um, so we wanted to recommend a way to kind of transition that and, and this is typically you would see a general service demand class kind of between. Um, so we decided to set the breakpoint general service demand will start at 50 kW and go to 500. And then at that point you're getting into more of the larger commercial so 500 and above is still the, the new large power where it was previously large power started at 50. Um, to get to where we can do rate design, we actually looked at every individual customer in both classes, general service and large power, and basically laid them out for fiscal year 22 and said, figured out based on their peak demand for that year, what class they would go into, and that's what we used to design the rates. So for a, there's not really a target revenue per se for this class because it was a combination of 3.9% and we, we kind of got there by doing all three classes at the same time. Um, but you'll see that general service demand class um, has a customer charge that's higher than general service. About, it's basically triple general service, half of, general, uh, of large power now. Um, the demand charge is much lower than what large power is and the energy charge is higher than general or lower than general service so it basically kind of splits the middle. Um, and this comes out to, you know, just under a 3%, I think, increase for the people that will be on this class. And you can kind of see some bill comparisons here I did. I put in kind of the impacts here based on comparing to general service or large power. Um, so you can see the smaller ones will be, have a much easier transition. You'll, you'll see basically, you'll see the same bill demand at various usage charges. So basically as load factor change, changes that the impact on bills is going to change. So we kind of show it different load factors at various levels to show that it may be lower, it may be higher based on load factor. So but we think this creates a, a good transition for your customers to kind of have that in-between rate. And then with the large power rate design, um, again, this is a 2.16% increase targeted. Uh, 
built up to the cost base charges again. Uh, and then it's basically just moderate rate changes, I think. With the first year, we kept the energy charge the same, put the increase to get to the 2% increase in the demand charge, and basically kind of scaled it just up from there. Um, and took a barely an increase in the energy charge the next year as well. Um, this, this is pretty straightforward. So the structure is uh, pretty much the same as it is, just with some small increases. Let me ask you this. I mean, like any community, obviously, you know, residential, we have people on fixed income. Mm -hmm. You obviously want it to be as affordable for them as you can. Yes. Government is just, they're collecting taxpayer dollars. The higher government rates are, the more tax dollars they need. Communities are in, interested in economic development. <laughs> Great job. So at the end of the day, you know, we have an industrial park here. You know, our city and county are interested in recruiting new yep. employers. Is this design on lar large power compared to other people that we compete with in the state of Kentucky, good or bad? I think it's good. I haven't done, done direct like economic development rate comparisons, um, but this should keep you structured pretty well, especially with your high load factor rate above this one, where like the rate energy charge goes down to like in the fours. Um, that shows anything with a a very high load factor data center type locations would have an incentive that the more energy they can put in relative to their peak, that rate's going to keep going. The average rate's going to keep going down. So. So would that make us? as attractive or more attractive than we are today to, um, a, to a large the high load factor one is more attractive okay and this is about the same as you are now okay but by keeping the rate increase lower than the system average that's adding to your competitiveness okay so depending on what lg and ku does um, and that's a lot of what policy making is doing is do you drive lower industrial rates because it's going to bring jobs and more residential customers or do you say well we're going to focus on our residential and keep them as low as possible and if industrial has to pay higher so be it that those are the hard decisions you all as regulators have to make um but that's you know that's that's part of it and that's a policy decision you and you're allowed to make either way yeah. and once again i'm going to make the same point i did earlier the none of these calculations this one included you're talking about right now None of these included the PCA. Correct. So, I mean, this what you see in this far right hand column, the the actual practical effect Better of that, that. is going to be much less. It's yes. going to be less than that. Correct. So, so I just want to make sure that everybody's still aware of that. Yeah. How difficult uh, would it be to to do a economic development rate comparison? Well, I, I you know sometimes someone may have economic development programs where they will use incentives to attract people, whether that be a, um, a, a, a graduated discount as someone comes into town where you get a 50% discount in year one, 40% mm -hmm. on down. Um, you can have those types. I'm not sure how much that is publicly available for your competitors. Um, usually those are kept in house because it's usually more confidential negotiations with potential customers. Um, but those are common as far as having those. And if a utility has them, they have to file that in their in their rate cases with the rate I would think an investor right? owned would, yes. 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 Um, but you also got to think is with economic development, um, the electric utility or the water utility is just one piece of the puzzle. And it's, it's usually integrated with the city's economic development team to, to bring a package to potential mm -hmm. businesses. Um, but I can, I can tell you electric rates will drive a lot of that decision making and, and it can tip the scales in some cases. If how difficult to follow up on Catherine's question. If, say, this board was interested in what that would look like, what would that entail to, to have that kind of? I mean, just just benchmarking it wouldn't it wouldn't take a whole lot because I mean we can. I mean, we you can, would set some load number and say if a utility if a company came in was using at least this much power, yeah, they could qualify for a new business or expansion sure. could qualify. And a lot of it's, it's, it's a new business or an expansion of an existing business. Right. So as long as there's net new load, um, they generally qualify for an econo economic development incentive of some sort. So that discount or that discount that you give, does that then get spread into that same class then? It does. Okay, yeah. so it doesn't get spread over to residential you, you or could, Actually, you, could, you can do that two ways. You can have, say what you know, comes out of the class, stays in the class, or you can budget a pool of dollars for economic development and set aside $500,000 and say, this is what we're going to use as incentives and we're going to have that pool. And it can be 
rate discounts. It can be um, in kind, putting an in infrastructure where the customer normally would have paid it. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can you can work with a potential customer to if you make things pool, more attractive. If you create that pool, your source of funds for that pool is everyone. Then everyone. Yeah. So it becomes it becomes a revenue requirement, and and then you could you know you could make a decision within a cost of service study to you know, assign those costs more towards the industrial classes. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, if it's, you know, that's where you make a decision in cost allocation. Is this something that benefits all customers and should be spread it to all customers? And if you had a separate pool of dollars budgeted, that's probably how I would do it as opposed to just keeping it within the class. But, so your point is really important, though. It, that there could be a, you have to look at the total package. Um, although, any you know company's going to be looking at what their what their electric bill will be over the next whatever years but compared to like something like property tax abatements those are usually <laughs> bigger on their their to-do list mm -hmm. so Got you. but yeah but integrating with you know if if the town of city of frankfurt has an economic development council or something to that effect um partnering with them would probably be good to say you know even if if there's a change in what you all do as a goal to say hey we want to get more into this we're willing to offer these as incentives to potentially attract more customers and bigger customers, and that's that's probably a positive thing. Okay. And those customers may be on the large industrial high load factor rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so what we talked about is we, you remember the cost-based demand charge is up up around the nineteen dollar range. And with a high load factor rate, I've, I've designed these where if you have a straight pass through of your power supply costs, I've done these without an energy charge. This where it's a customer and a demand charge, and then everything else is just straight pass through of energy. Um, with this, I wanted to scale. So currently, you know, these two rates, the demand charge and energy charge, are just lower than large power. So they're, they get a benefit by being high load factor, but not anything directly variable with their load. By giving them a higher demand charge and a lower energy charge, um, that means the, the more their load factor increases, their average cost per kilowatt hour when combining everything goes down. So that gives them an incentive to increase load factor. Anytime you all increase load factor, that's good for the entire system because that's putting more kilowatt hours for the same peak demand charge to KYMEA. So that's why high load factor customers are valuable because you're spreading more kilowatt hours to spread all those fixed costs across. So that's why we've dropped the energy charge down to about four and a half cents. And then it stays about there the next year too. So with municipal and gratis rates, so this we kind of talked about and it's, this is where this is purely a policy decision on your end. Um, I don't necessarily find it necessary to charge certain customers less because you're not for profit, because this means you're charging other cost or customers more to make up the difference. So that's one of my rationales for not charging schools or municipal governments, things like that. Um, but there, there's certainly no problem with it, with doing it if you want to continue. So I've basically designed rates as, oh, you're going to continue to have this rate class, both for yourselves and for your municipal. Um, but as I said, I, I recommend creating a municipal demand rate, which would apply both to the gratis demand rate for like the water treatment plant and the, uh, any other customers above 50 kW uh, for on the municipal rate. And you'll see this is very much structured as a straight off the new general service demand rate. It's basically about a 5% discount to the new GSD rate. Um, so it's kind of the same concept. You've got the standard rate they bring on, the discount from that. So you'll still have some that are on the general service or, or the standard municipal rate, which is similar to the general service. Anything above 50 kW would recommend be on the municipal uh, demand rate, which is structured as a discount to GSD or general service demand. When you talk about the electric vehicles, what does that entail? Like just a separate rate for charger? I mean, like people okay. can have chargers at their home, mm -hmm. but they can have, you know, like the city of Frankfurt has put in a you know we've put them in they paid the bill we've got some around town say if like Myers in louisville which is a big or walmart in georgetown has a lot of yeah. chargers so that's a rate just for those charging stations no i, I it's not well i it would hopefully apply to them it all depends on who owns the chargers 
Okay. If it's a commercial customer and if Walmart owns the chargers and it's just part of their electric bill, they're probably already on the, the large industrial rate. And that would just fall into their normal rate. Yeah. The problem is when you, where electric utilities like you get in a situation where you're not recovering your costs is if, say, the municipal, and I think we looked at this last year in the rate design, what it actually costs to pay to serve those loads. Remember, they're real high peaks and rarely get used. So there's no kilowatt hours coming through for a very high peak. And if you do the math, it comes out to the rate should be about 35 cents a kilowatt hour. And if you don't have that demand charge, and you're only charging them 9.8 or 9.8.9 .9 cents. So severe mismatch in what it costs you and what they're paying you for that service. So the biggest concern is ones that um, customers own that aren't on a demand rate. And even with the demand rate, it's, you're still not going to recover that cost. It just makes it more equitable. Um, and we get into, you know, so it's, that's one of the, as we get into the PURPA part of this, equitable and affordable is one of the things that goes into that. Um, but again, it's, it's a policy decision, a zero. And if you're okay under recovering in some areas and recovering it from other people, then that's fine. For example, and, and John knows a lot about this, in, like if Frankfurt were fortunate to get one of those national charging stations mm -hmm. along the interstate, would having a special rate for EV chargers and that make us more attractive for someone to build there? Or they're going to just charge whatever and pass it on <laughs> to the consumer? It'd be very attractive if you keep it the way you are now. Right. So <laughs> we, what we, we've been doing a lot of this lately, and usually the, the answers are um, the best case for you to have their, their rate tied to your coincident peak, kind of like you're having a CP rate, so it's matched with your power supply cost. Um, the other way to do this is time of use and having knowing that um, even though your out costs don't vary hourly, your, your on-peak costs are when that, whenever that CP demand hits. And you could probably know within a, probably a four-hour window when that happens each month or target it. Excuse me. And if you build an on-peak rate around that period where you're probably going to hit your CP, then you can have a much lower energy charge the rest of the day. And it may, and usually with situations like this, they're way more varied where it might be like a you can charge a six cent rate, but it might dump up to 35 cents during the peak times. Yep. Um, the other option is load control where you just kind of shut them down during the CP, but yep. customers don't like that and I wouldn't recommend that. So definitely multiple ways you can do it. Um, just having a demand charge in general is a good first step. And then there's other ways to get, then, then you get to drawing the balance between full cost recovery versus promoting electrification. And then that's, there's a balance there as well. Quick question. With the technologies today, I assume like customers driving down the road, they can see on their phone the different stations mm -hmm. and what they're currently charging at that time. So if someone was driving down the road and suddenly jumped to that 35 cents a kilowatt yeah. hour, they'll see that before they get off and yeah. figure mm -hmm. out how to plug their car in and then suddenly see that. And a lot of chargers just charge 35 cents a kilowatt hour all the time. Yeah. Oh, wow. So <laughs> a, lot, a lot of them do. Yeah. But because there's also there's the piece to recover the capital cost of the right. charger itself. That's and that's that goes beyond the power supply right. cost itself. And this so. is, I mean, just as a rough estimate, if you're charging 35 cents a kilowatt hour, what is that? I know that EVs have a different capacities, but what does a fill up look like? So, so say you've got a a level three charger, which is a, a DC mm -hmm. a DC fast charger, DC fast, right. most of around 150 kW right now, right. which means you could, you know, fill that up in probably 30 minutes and get a, a mostly load. So. You're, yeah, you're, 40, you're still 40, 10, you know, not less than 10 bucks probably yeah. compared to a tank of gas. So, at 30 yeah, yeah. At 35. Yeah. yeah, so it's 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 still comparable. But yeah, thing is, people charge their cars at home. Yeah. And and but even on that, it's it's you have to be more cognizant of not. You cannot. I won't, don't want to say allow. Getting your customers to not come home from work and plug in mm -hmm. at five o'clock when you're about to hit your peak. Right. That hurts you a lot. And that's where we are really getting to a lot of people with going to time of use rates where you're sending, any, you're sending a price signal to your residential customers as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing we do with that is you can have a three-part rate where it gets really, really cheap from midnight to 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. Home chargers are programmable. If you mm -hmm. say, we'll charge you three cents a kilowatt hour from midnight to 6 a.m. Right. So a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, 
and we can do all kinds of fun stuff once we get that AMA project finished, AMI project finished. So the traditional flat residential rate you're starting to see with charging stations. And it's yeah, it's, and that's kind of what my front end thing is like. That's worked for a long time, and the the industry itself and how people use electricity is changing, and and the way you know the the, the spikes are are way different than they used to be. So you just have to be more cognizant about cost recovery and being able to send the right price signal to your customers. Okay. Of course, overall, it's good for Greg to have that power use at night. Cause it is, yeah. Really Again, yeah, that's, that's raising your, your system load factor, but in the opposite, if they're charging on peak, that could be very detrimental to everybody. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Lighting, I won't go into lighting a ton. Uh, here's the punchline. Every rate goes up by 5.8% each year. And because they were they were pretty severely under recovering as well, so those rates are just going up. Um, real simple. Look at the last rate; the rate goes up by that amount. So, uh, rate design summary. So just this is basically just this is the results of the revenue generated uh, by each of the rates we've proposed. It's kind of what we call the revenue proof. Shows that this is the actual this isn't the target of the actual revenue chain for each. Occasionally, you'll see one slightly off from rounding because you can't have an energy charge that goes out to eight decimal places. Um, but both the rate designs for 24 and 25 do generate on a system level uh, the 3.9%. From what you're seeing, I mean, you all do work around the nation. Mm -hmm. The increases we're looking at for the next two years, how's that compared to what you're seeing around the country? Most people have had much larger power supply increases. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, you know, I've had one in Florida where they're power supply rider for everything jumped from four cents to seven and a half cents in one month. And it's back down to five and a half cents, hopefully. But yeah, they're all over the place. And it's all driven by the extreme volatility in natural gas prices for the most part in 2022, where gas prices went from the $2 range up to nine, and they're back in the two range now. So I, I think it's going to be less volatile next year. Um, so hopefully part of the power supply increase from KYMEA is, is uh, it, it, it lags when it gets to you, but I don't. I wouldn't think you're going to continue to see 10% rate increases from them, assuming things stay fairly flat. But yes, rates are going up, especially on the power supply side, all across the nation. Ms. Chairman, um, actually, Ms. Snyder asked me a question for the ECA from KYMA. I just correct me, all the people in here, based on that six dollars seventy-five cents per megawatt hour annually. To, to plan board right now is a 4.59, 4.6 million dollar each year. If that's a standard we charge like every month. For this two rate hike for two year, the revenue is 4.9 million dollar. So we drop that 4.6 from July, but the, this two increase is higher than that, but it's a two year. I'm not sure that makes yeah. any sense to you. No, it is. Let me ask this from a, a policy standpoint. Obviously, there's a lot here and a lot for the board to digest. And then, obviously, you know, we'll have a public hearing and we'll have comments. And then, I mean, obviously, the, the municipal issue is a major is a decision we need to make. The economic, whether we want to do something on economic development, what are the other major, from your standpoint, from a policy? I mean, obviously, we can. So we want to shift more to residential. You know, or shift I think more there's a couple industrial. things. That, yeah, that's yeah. on that. So, are you comfortable with making targeted adjustments based on the cost of service study and getting residential more than the system average? Mm -hmm. That's important. I, I think you're okay with the general service demand class. I would think, but it's you know, um, we've made targeted adjustments to the customer charge to increase those closer to cost of service. So those are going up more than energy charges, and so over two years you're. Residential customer charge is going from 11.45 to 18. That's controversial in some places. I have customers that are getting it up to closer to 30 dollars. You know, so it's 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 interesting across the country where you see it's still controversial to have an eight dollar customer charge. Um, I'm very much, as you know, especially on the customer side, knowing that we don't really recover that you're recovering most of your demand cost and energy. I try to get those customer costs recovered as fully as possible in the customer charge. And that helps as the industry changes and you have people using the system differently that at least you're getting that first line uh, covered in, in the charge. But again, that's a policy decision for you all as well. 
And then how many utilities, either municipal or, or uh, for-profit, whatever, how many use or have an economic development type rate, would you say? How common is that? You know, I don't always see that side of it. Um, I'm working through it on a couple of really, really big ones right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to have some recent experience with them. <laughs> I can tell you they are a lot of times, are, my, the important thing with that is, one way to look at it is like, what's the lowest amount we can charge them? And usually the, the benchmark for a non-discriminatory rate is fully recovering your variable costs and making a contribution to your fixed costs. Okay. And, and at that point, you're deemed non-discriminatory. Mm -hmm. So figuring out what that low point is and saying, how low could we go? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of basically it's your power supply cost plus a contribution to your, your fixed costs. Um, and then it's how it's structured. The important thing to me is whatever the incentive is, it be temporary. It's not permanent. Right. And they're usually about five years. Um, but I've seen some go to 10. Maybe it's a, a huge customer you're trying to draw. Um, but yeah, knowing what that, how far you can go with an incentive, and then that's knowing it benefits the entire system and then making sure it's temporary. That's kind of my key guardrails or guide rails, if you will. Because what I've seen a lot in economic development deals is it's good to do those things to bring somebody in. Mm -hmm. But you always have the backlash from your existing customers yes. who are sitting there saying, yeah, I'm not expanding, but I've maintained my employment all yep. along. I'm doing everything. You're bringing in a competitor. <laughs> and yeah. you're giving him a better rate. Yeah. How's that fair? It's, I've been here 20 years. It's not easy conversations, yeah. Yeah. Well, and like, like Craig said, the grand scheme of things, at the end, mm -hmm. those fixed costs are a zero-sum game. Yeah, somebody's got to pay for them. Yeah, they're going and somewhere. They, they, somebody's going to pay for them, and whether you know, for every dollar you don't get through that incentive, mm -hmm. you're going to have to charge off somewhere else. Yeah. So, and hopefully, like I said, it's just temporary. Right. So the end Absolutely. result is you've got a bigger system Absolutely. and more people contributing right. to those fixed costs. Right. Yeah. And hopefully, it comes with the jobs. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, but it's hard for people to to remember. Well, maybe we won't have a tax increase mm -hmm. right. because we have right. bigger revenues in our city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's worth pointing out in the budget draft before you tonight on that we'll talk about on the 31st on pages 20 and 21 are the electric revenue information. Mm -hmm. We have the rates as laid out for 24 and 25 recommended. Those rates have been put in for years 24 and 25 in the budget. So I just want to let you know that the budget you have is based upon this cost of service study. So. so if the board would choose to want to do something different, your budget is untouched as long as we still continue to generate that amount of revenue? Yes, sir. Okay. If for some reason decisions were made to reduce revenue, then we need to discuss the Work. expense side and, and how we make it, the, uh, how it, make it balance. Cuts we need to make, okay. And you know, I think it's and I think it's important for people watching. Obviously, nobody wants to raise rates, and everybody says, "Well, plan board, you ought to cut costs." But on the weekend we had, when we took all that damage, everybody wanted their lights on right away. Sure. And you can't have good equipment and well-trained people, and pay them overtime and get everything back on, and say we're going to cut back and not have as much equipment or fewer people. Or we're not going to work overtime this weekend. We'll get you on sometime next week. Right. Yeah, we'll get around to you Wednesday or Thursday. So I think another thing to remember, and it sometimes gets forgotten in this, is the last electric rate increase that the plant board had was in 2017. Mm -hmm. So if you think about everything you purchase, buy, and deal with, and the, the vast inflationary change that we've seen in the last couple of years, the plant board has been completely unchanged on electric since 2017. Yeah. So. Well, while no one wants to see this happen, and yeah. you, you never want to change your prices yeah. ever, you know that's just not realistic. Yeah. Based on we're, we're we're in the marketplace as the Frankfurt Plant Board, just like everyone else, and we've talked about how much our trucks are going up and our equipment, and you know we're experiencing what everyone else has. Yeah. Yes, but on, uh, on your point, even if because you got your power back on, you saved everything in your fridge and freezer, mm -hmm. right? That I mean, mm -hmm. that alone. Yep. Mm -hmm compensates for yeah. or you didn't have to stay in a hotel for three days mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman actually you know I just uh, follow what Wen said you know I agree 100 percent what he said but there's another part I do want to you know I mean I know you have a concern we do too is we don't take that lightly right. you know actually right. we don't want to any hike uh, at all we still believe this 
is a much lower than the utility world in the last three years. Mm -hmm. Layer hike is significantly higher than yeah. this, as we know. Um, but we don't want to take lightly because we do know there is a low income family um, very hard dealing today. Uh, we, we don't want to take that lightly. So it's very hard for us in the beginning to say what a number we want to. We just want to really make a balance, just move on, follow. You know, the, the second year reading is necessary, but I hope KYMEA can do something next year. Hopefully, we don't have to do that, but I kind of doubt that because the the catch up what happened last year so all the natural gas coal right. price particularly KYME spent 11 million their money to buy down the rate last year too that's kind of catch up currently too um, but fundamentally I, I do want you to know I mean nobody take that lightly I know this group of people we had many discussing can we do less can we do something differently and Vin made a good point. I mean, mm -hmm. we've, this agency has pretty much held the line for six years, and did the market rebate, did rebates there. for several of those years too. Mm -hmm. Rebated for yes, several yes. of those years as well. Yeah. The rebate we gave is a more than <coughs> right. Yes. Yeah. People like the rebates. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so this kind of brings the conclusion of the <coughs> kind of the rate study piece of it. Uh, we got one more thing to talk about, and that's some some new PERPA standards. Um, we've added a bit of this to the um, report. This actually expanded it on a bit for the presentation, and we're going to add it to the final report. So there are some new standards that <coughs> came out for PERPA, which is the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act of 1978. Um, this gets updated by Congress occasionally, adds on to it. Um, this generally applies to regulated utilities. There, there are certain things within this that apply to municipals as well. And so kind of want to talk about what your obligations are as a regulatory agency, which is what you are. Um, so as part of the Infrastructure and Investments Job Act of 2021, or the IIJA, there's two new standards uh, related to demand response and EV charging programs. And your obligation is to consider and determine whether or not to adopt the two new standards proposed by the regulatory, the new regulatory standards. So this is something you have to have effectively a formal process that's publicly and documented that shows you have considered these two new standards. So just to kind of read this, the obligation of the board is, the due process required by a purpose includes the requirement that the determination as to the appropriateness of a particular standard take place after public notice and hearing and in writing. And based on the, f the findings included in such determination upon evidence presented at the hearing, and that the, they should be, the evidence should be made available to the public. So you have until November 15, 2023 to get through this process, which would include um, kind of documenting effectively where you are today and um, having a public hearing that's been announced, holding it, talking about effectively what you're kind of talking what you do today related to these standards and if you're going to consider new things so the new standards are related to demand response so it says each electric utility shall promote the use of demand response and demand flexibility practices by commercial residential and industrial consumers to reduce electricity consumption during periods of unusually high demand uh, i'm going to talk about what some of those things are on the next slide so i just want to go get through the the ev charging one is each state shall consider measures to promote greater electrification of the transportation sector, including establishing rates that promote affordable and equitable electric vehicle charging options, which they put affordable and equitable in the same sentence. I like that. Um, improve customer experience associated with electric vehicle charging. Uh, accelerate third-party investment by EV charging and appropriately recover the marginal cost of delivering electricity to the EVs and the charging infrastructure. So what are the, some of the things you could consider? Um, so I don't think you have a whole lot of what would be considered demand response programs. And I don't think you have a, um, a residential load control program, um, which is where you have 
basically the ability to cycle residential customers' ACs on and off. Mm -hmm. So you hit your, your, you know your CP is coming, and you're gonna start basically lowering the demand of the system when that is. Um, time of use rates in general is considered demand response. So if you're sending an economic signal to your customers that says, use less here, and it's okay to use some here, or it's gonna cost you a lot more if you do here, that's promoting demand response. Um, you can have commercial demand response programs where um, you know, there's the concept of interruptible or curtailable rates where you will pay someone less um, if you can shut them off. Um, it's kind of a carrot and a stick sort of way. You can also have a demand response program that says, if we have a period of high demand and we need to reduce peak demand, we'll pay you if you reduce from where you are now during that period. Um, that might not work as well with your system just because there's that, that high demand is gonna be every month on that CP and you'd have to specifically target it. Um, but something that, that some similar utilities to you that have a similar power agency have is they will have a class with a coincident peak rate where their actual demand charge is based on whatever the KYNDA demand charges are and it's got a much lower energy charge. Um, but they also, it's usually the ones that benefit from this are the people that actually have the ability to really reduce their load certain times or have generators installed on site. Um, some of the ones I work with in North Carolina, they will actually have generators that kick on when that CP signal comes. It'll really reduce their load, but it reduces the entire system's load and everyone benefits. Um, so if you can have your larger customers tied to that CP where their demand charge is only based on that CP hour and not the non-coincident peak, then that could actually help a lot with spreading out the cost of those um, your KYMEA bill. Uh, from an EV charging perspective, time of use rates work very well. You can, like we talked about this, you can have the dual signal of sending a high price when you don't want them to charge and a very low price when you want to send them to charge. Um, you can have a make ready infrastructure program, which is really about having, being, ha being able to supply all the equipment up to the point where they can just come in and set up a charger. You talked about the ones on the transportation corridors and getting one of those. Um, if that's a balancing act of it may cost you a lot to do that but you be able, may be able to draw more load by having a program like that. I know when we visited the lg &E solar site, they talked about that they didn't have a program that they would purchase the EV charging for like retailers or restaurants and then recover it, both the cost of electricity and the cost of the unit like over a three year period or something. I remember they talked about that they had that kind of program. I don't know what their success in it has been, but they had in essence, they were financing uh, retailers, commercial, to okay. install them and then recovering their cost through the rates. Yeah. And a typical make ready program is really more about the, the underground conductor, the transformer, all that stuff up to the pad, where it's really just where they can just come in and set their, set their okay. chargers and, and make it easier for them. So. But don't you feel like we're in kind of a little bit different era mm -hmm. that... Um, the Walmarts and whoever are, mm -hmm. they're going to want to have those chargers. Mm -hmm. So I just don't think the incentive, us having to supply the incentive is as necessary as it was a few years ago. Especially for the charger itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's definitely a, a lot of well, government money from the IAJA, right. plus people just wanting to put them in for their own goals. Um, I generally, Telling municipal utilities to not put them in themselves because it is so hard to recover the cost. Mm -hmm. um, but also, yeah, just the, the, the infra it is a lot of infrastructure to serve some of these loads. Typical level two charger, you won't even notice a blip, but your electric you know, operations division is going to notice if you have a bunch of 250 kW chargers mm -hmm. all at one site, you can have a megawatt of load somewhere along a highway really quick, and that's going to have impacts on your system and the ability to get power there. Um, could be expensive to build that, and how that cost is shared with the customer and mm -hmm. absorbed with the system is, is an important decision. So next steps, um, as far as between now and November, which means you probably got to start fairly soon, kind of document your existing policies and programs related to these two concepts. Um, identify any potential programs that you would want to be considered, and um, Kind of develop a, a public statement. Figure out, uh, make the document public, um, announce it. You know, announce a public hearing. Say it's when it's going to happen. Say what it's about. 
Um, hold a separate public hearing specifically for this like you do in your general time frames. Um, let them give you feedback on what they think is important and, and the board formally documents any changes proposed or that no changes are recommended at all. Like I said, and this, this is, is only your obligation is to consider it. And this is all separate process. from the rate design. This is totally, yeah, so this is right. totally separate. I assume this would trail the rates. So I don't mm, think yes. you would be able to no. have this prepared by no. later this month. <laughs> so this would be more over the summer probably. Yeah. I think that's it. Sorry if I took up too much time. No, no, no you did it. You no, always do a good job, good. sir. It's great. It's Thank you. Yeah. Um, Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, I just have one comment about uh, um, TOU, time date rate. Mm -hmm. Long term is probably not a bad idea proposal in the future to have a program in place, but it's a volunteer base. Would you think, I mean, would that be for all customers or residential or for business or for A lot of it is for residential because actually residential is a created summer peaking for us, mm -hmm. air conditioned load. Right. And uh, uh, I just give you an example, like California right now, right? If you have a solar installed in your house, which is very popular over there, their requirement is you have to take a TOU. You cannot have a fixed rate. You have to take a time date rate. Or if you want to have a charging, which is they can charge one time, put a vehicle 70 or 100 kilo hour one night or one day, uh, which is a house can only use 20, 30 in a kilo hour. They can use a lot in a very short time. Uh, but when you look at California, they have a called dark curve, which is in the daytime, they already have a more solar in the system than the load. They are starting to export the power to outside the California system. But as soon as 4 or 4.30, the solar go away, then the people driving home to have a, start to have a both load, commercial and residential, then they created the second peak. Normally it's not, but last what they put in 4 to 9 o'clock is the highest cost. I, I give you some example, as I know, I saw it, a friend of mine shared with me in California, San Diego. Their time day rate is like 83 cents, it's residential, between four to nine. Then at the night, if you have a electric vehicle from 12 to six, only 10 cents. But the rest is a 50, so it's average still 50 cents. So, but you do create that peak for people, hopefully they don't use it. I'm talking volunteers because not everyone can really use that. Particularly if you have elderly, you have a sick, you know, you need air conditioning. Part of California can be 100 degree too in the house. So you need that air conditioning. You don't want to force people to say, I want to cut a saving to really risk their family. People live all that. So be, volunteers make sense. Gary or Ben or Trav, what would be the process? We've got this document. We've had the presentation. We'll have the public hearing. Get the comments. The board has to make a decision for that. Then, do we immediately begin working Craig, on this purple? I, I would think so. Yeah, just to, just to you know, so you don't have delays where you get towards the end. I don't think there's anyone that's going to be checking to see if you have it done by November 15th, but obviously you want to be compliant with this. Yeah, you know, we could probably, you know, we could probably direct the staff to have something for us maybe at the August meeting, and we could have maybe Because a lot of these things are going to be maybe priced have, out, maybe have, a, maybe have a public hearing in September, and mm -hmm. that would give us plenty of time to make any decisions we needed to make. Would that sound? I don't know if KU still does it. Do they still install, uh, when I lived in the county, KU had that, where they, you know, they would turn off your air conditioner or cycle it at certain times in the day you know, it would turn off your air conditioner for like 20 minutes. Do they still do that, Ben, or is that is that program gone away, or are they still doing that? I think it's still around, it's yeah. Still, I had one on there. Yeah. I have one on there. Yeah. I think the other thing to remember about what you're talking about is you need to consider the things. You can consider them and say, for instance, there's a few things I personally wouldn't implement until you had your AMI. Right. That gives you a lot more options on some things. You, you can consider things and say, well, we're going to take action on that.
six months from now or a year from now, mm -hmm. I mean, remember, it's, it's considered. You don't have to right. take action to implement a bunch right. of programs by it's considerate, make a plan if you decide you want to, mm -hmm. but that plan doesn't have to be implemented by, right. Right. by November. Right. November. Yeah. Okay. But just consider it, take public input, and, and again, later on, having a, after we kind of get some ideas, maybe if we're throwing some things out there as public information, and you could just, okay, public, what do you think? And then mm -hmm. have that public hearing, let them come in, mm -hmm. voice their concerns, and then the staff could report back to you. I think John's probably right. Probably at the June meeting, we probably need to adopt some type of draft schedule yeah. to yeah. follow up on that this summer and get that done. Yeah. Yeah. KU, by the way, KU has a time day rate for exactly. quite a while in their system. But it's not a, it's a volunteer base. Customer can choose to use that. But they already have that. The, if it's a volunteer, that would. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, it's in order. I would like to make a motion to accept the electric cost of service and rate design state has been presented here this evening. Uh, direct staff to post it up on the website and also schedule a public hearing on May 31st for uh, customer input into the findings and recommendations of the study. Mm -hmm. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's adopted. Travis, thank you. Craig, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, General Manager, comments? Hold it, wait a minute, no. Uh, whoa. No, no, no. No, we're at FanDuel. <laughs> 6 6.4, we're adjourned, no. 6.4, uh, approving FanDuel TV and FanDuel Racing Renewal. Make sure you don't forget about me. No. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, staff and the Cable Advisory Committee recommend approval of the FanDuel TV and FanDuel Racing Renewal. This is an NCTC agreement with a term through March 31st of 2023. Uh, FanDuel TV, uh, formerly known as TVG, is on Classic Cable Channel 41, and FanDuel Racing, which is formerly known as TVG2, is on Preferred Cable Channel 145. Uh, there's not previously been a licensee and, uh, for these channels, and this renewal um, affords us the ability to maintain that arrangement. Uh, networks contain live coverage and analysis of horse racing, international basketball, MMA, and other live sports, and no additional carriage requirements are included in this agreement. Hmm? Have any questions for Harvey? Um, Harvey, yes, when uh, I remember I was on the cable advisory board when we got TVG yes. here, part of that agreement at that time was that the folks in Frankfurt who got TVG accounts and you know within our system, that we got a small, small, yeah. small percentage of that. Is that completely gone yeah, away? Yeah, I was. You know, I had the same memory, and it was not the case in the agreement that we had. Right, just I didn't expired. See it in, I didn't see the agreement. Yeah, and okay. it wasn't on this one. It wasn't in the one previous. So okay. it went away at some point. Okay, um, I just yeah, that was the case, but that was you know, long time ago. Maybe to, 10 to, years to gin ago. up interest in it yeah. or whatever. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't uh, an oversight or they were, sure. they were making a change, but I didn't know if that had stayed through the years. Any other questions for Harvey? Not. Do we have a motion? Uh, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Approved. Item 6.5, consider approving CBS TV Everywhere Agreement. Harvey. Thank you. Uh, staff and the Cable Advisory Committee recommend approving the CBS TV Everywhere Agreement. This is a direct agreement with a term through December 15th of 2024. Um, we carried all the, the broadcast channels on video on demand, which uh, we, we sunset earlier this year. We encouraged our customers to, to get that content through TV Everywhere apps. Um, we did not have an agreement with CBS for TV Everywhere. They were the only broadcaster that we didn't. Um, and they don't have them with all of uh, all the operators either. So we were able to negotiate this direct agreement, uh, which will allow our cable customers to get access to their on-demand, CBS's on-demand content uh, through their app uh, at no charge. And there's no charge to us, and there won't be any charge to our customers. Um, so uh, so yeah, the only requirement is that we have an, a valid uh, retransmission consent agreement in place. So we have that today with WKYT which, uh, as a reminder, expires at the end of this year. Uh, but hopefully there won't be any issues with that, but that's the only requirement for this agreement. And um, uh, staff attorney reviewed it and it meets with his approval, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have on this side of it. Okay, any questions for Harvey on this? No, do we have a motion? So moved. We have a second. Second. 
We have a motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Approved. Harvey, uh, consider uh, item 6.6, .6, consider approving Turner Affiliate Agreement. Yes, sir. The Cable Advisory Committee and staff recommend the board approve the NCTC agreement with uh, Warner Media Network Sales for the Turner Network Services Agreement. This has a term through May 31st of 2025. The networks that are included in this agreement are CNN, Headline News, TBS, TNT, Cartoon Network, True TV, and Turner Classic Movies, all on Classic Cable. Uh, there's no retail rate increase this year. The annual increase is beginning January 1 of 2024, as well as in 2025, average 6% across the whole group. Uh, those were bu those uh, increases were budgeted higher than we wished, but they were what we anticipated. Um, as a reminder, uh, Turner shares uh, the rights to the NCAA basketball tournament with CBS. Those games are consistently uh, the highest viewed on uh, FPB's cable system every year. Uh, and we all, this agreement also contains protection against any loss of uh, sports content. So no additional carriage or migration requirements in this extension. I'd be happy to answer any questions on this item. Harvey, we do meet the um, um, percentage of our penetration numbers or we get the lowest rate? We do, yes, Okay, sir. all right. Any questions for Harvey? We still keep me TV, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we took care of that one a while ago. Sorry, buddy. John, oh. Q John Q. Bad channel. That's right. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Agreement's approved. Item 6.7, Sarah accepting minutes of the February 15, 2023 Cable Advisory Committee meeting. Yes, sir. Those are uh, presented through your acceptance. Uh, they've already been approved by the advisory committee. Mm -hmm. Make Any motion. Questions? Make motion. We approve. You know, motion. Do we have a second? Second. You have a motion. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. Motion to approve. Uh, consider amendments to the job classification and compensation plan. Reclassify customer service uh, supervisor position. This is, uh, I guess, uh, what would you say, Michelle? Cleaning up organizationally. Yes. Um, that we have not had that position, the director's position, sent filled since when? About 2017. 2017. 2017. So that's been on the books. This eliminates that and redoes, redefines or reclassifies the two customer service supervisors? Yes. Okay. So staff, staff asked the board to consider the elimination of the customer service director position and reclassify the customer service supervisor position due to the proposed director position being eliminated. With the proposed reclassification, the customer service supervisor position will absorb additional duties of the director and report directly to the chief financial officer who will provide higher level guidance for the customer service department. Based on an evaluation of the customer service supervisor job description to include the additional job duties, the recommended classification for this position would move to a grade 114 from a grade 112. There is money in the current budget for this change. FEB staff is requesting the board to approve the elimination of the customer service director position, the revised customer service supervisor position, job description, and associated salary grade to a 114 effective April 17th of 2023. The proposed job description is included in the detail pages on page 247 for this board item. As I understand it, David, this from a budget standpoint, from a budgeted position standpoint, actually is a net savings, right? Yes, sir. So you eliminate with the director and the increases to the two supervisors are less <coughs> than what the salary would have been for a director. Any questions of Michelle or David? Uh, make a motion to approve uh, the uh, uh, change in the job description for the customer service supervisor and the elimination of the job uh, customer service director position. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It's approved. Thank you. Thank you. General Manager comments? <laughs> but we have a big thing, what, on Thursday? The deep pancaking? Yes. Which could be huge for us going forward. Yes. Yes. And we don't have any idea where FERC's going to go, right? Just that they're going to do something. Not really. This is the one, uh, as we know, both parties uh, filed a lawsuit, you know, U.S. Appeal Court in D.C. 
uh, regard of work this season happened a year and a half ago, a little longer ago, about a deep pancake, which is the decision they made that time. The deep pancake will be terminated by December, no, Jan- uh, June, May 31st, May 31st, 2029. Which is a huge impact to not an SRK KYMA nine member, also to Kempa, which is Paducah, Princeton, and Owensboro, uh, all municipal. So the result of a lawsuit, FERC have to make some decision. We certainly hope the decision can benefit to us, which is we believe uh, our customers should. Because this could be that. millions of dollars for our customers, right, on an annual basis? Is Yes. Can be a lot. You know, it depends on which way it goes. But I do want you to know that the FERC already made a decision, same issue. This is just a, a appeal court order, then uh, ask a, you know, FERC to re, you know, reconsider right. on that. So we will say what happened by Thursday. I certainly hope I want to read it as soon as I saw it. But maybe Friday or whenever attorney review it, Send to us. So I will assume I have a share with you. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Anything else, Gary? Um, anything under old or new business? Okay, Mr. Snyder. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to request permission to call closed session uh, for several matters pursuant to Carrier 61A101B for deliberations in the future acquisitions of real property, since publicity would likely affect the value of a specific piece of property to be acquired for public use. Also under care is 61A101C, discuss pending or proposed litigation regarding property, cost recovery, and products matter. And a telecom matter as well, okay. Uh, also under care is 61A101G, to discuss specific proposal that have hopefully discussed and jeopardize the siting, retention, expansion, or upgrading of a business. Also under 61A101M, discuss infrastructure records that expose a vulnerability through the disclosure of the location and configuration of public utility critical systems exempted from disclosure under CARES 61878-1M1F and also under CARES 61810-1N to discuss the selection of a bidder for the award of a contract. We have Would anyone like me to repeat that motion? Huh? Would anyone like me to repeat that motion? Line four. No. Do, do we, have a, we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion second. All those in favor of going into closed session pursuant to the motion, say aye. 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 Those opposed? We're going into closed session. We'll come back in five minutes. Need a motion to come out of closed session? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Motion is second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? We're out of closed session. Mr. Snyder? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we only have one action item coming out of the closed session. Um, I would like to make a motion to authorize the Levin team to represent FPB per a legal services agreement and take any necessary and appropriate legal steps to protect FPB's rights in a product's liability matter. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's approved. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. We have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. All those in favor of adjournment? Aye. aye. Those opposed, we're adjourned. Thank you all. Steve.